this bug you? No. Does this bug you? No. I'm not podcasting you. Does this bug you? <laughs> you are podcasting me. Oh, oh. Hey. Hi, folks. Hello. <sighs> it's uh, the 16th of December, 2017. Yep, it's inevitable. And uh, we'll get this out tomorrow, probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got a big show for you tonight. <laughs> we like prepped yeah we did a little bit of prep okay yeah like a little bit not like everything but like we we did some work so so maybe it'll show maybe it'll show in the show um walk a week is that our first i was gonna i was gonna do um, books and books and and, what i'm reading yes yeah so um first segment what we're reading and what we're watching I'm afraid to touch anything and make noise. I'm trying to juggle all my books. Got, <laughs> this is why I didn't this bring books to Piled to up review. on our lap. Yeah, and they're you sliding know. off. My glasses are falling off my head. <clears throat> Sorry. This is ridiculous. I need to get you a little, like, a nightstand. I just can't even. Oh, all right, all right, fine. I need to get you a little nightstand over there or something. I'll do it, okay? But yeah, oh, I'll turn out to grimace if I hear all, everything okay. fall on the so floor. So I'm trying to... All right, so I'm going to do my thing. Do your thing. All right. I'm reading some books. And Yay! As I've said in the past, I'm not really... You don't um, blow through books at the rate that I do. I don't blow through books the rate you do. And I don't really, I honestly don't actually even enjoy reading books, the kinds of books you read. I really prefer for my pleasure reading to read um, nonfiction and how-to books. Yes. So, yeah. um, yeah, I like I'm, I'm glossing, I gloss over the, the fiction that I'm reading. I don't talk about that on this show a whole lot, but right, there so, is other, there's stuff I'm reading all the time. Right. And I'm, and I just don't read in that way. I read a lot of <clears throat> articles. Yes. Uh, online that I can put down and come back to without, I don't know, finding coffee on it or something. <laughs> so, um, but what I do keep around are like Oh, the baby chewed up the, Aww, the internet. <laughs> look at that. The whole internet. The whole internet. Sorry, it's my baby. She, she ate Vox.com. Wow. Do they know about that yet? <laughs> um, but no, I, I actually do a fair amount of re- other reading mm-hmm. of, um, really, it's, Things like skills based things. How how to how and, to and, and et cetera. Yeah. Uh, and organizational development stuff, right? Well, I do read like a lot of your 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 um vocation stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I do a lot of um reading on how to run good meetings and how to have good interpersonal process, things like that. So not to mention the Montessori or Montessori stuff. stuff, yeah. That's the kind of stuff I read. And the catechism catechesis stuff. Yeah. So um so anyway, this week, where I've got my wheelhouse, um, this is the time of year. Those of you that garden know the catalogs are out. Well, the seed catalogs oh, the seed start catalogs. to arrive. Grace is like I'm starting to salivate. Salivating. <laughs> I'm not even holding the catalog. Just thinking about all the mm. fruits and veggies. But the first, the first catalog of the season. Yeah. Seed Savers Exchange. Oh, Seed Savers. Oh, yeah. and Seed Savers. No, is... I, I'm not even that into f- gardening food, and mm. I'll read this and salivate. And, yeah. But mostly I'm like, it's beautiful. I want to, I'd like to try that. that I looks... want to eat that. Yeah. yeah. So there's some great things in here. Seed Savers Exchange, for those of you that maybe have never heard of them before, yeah. um, is an outstanding organization. They are working to preserve heritage and heirloom seed varieties um, from the Americas. And we've gotten foods from stuff from them before. Yeah, outstanding. And, and raised them. And, they have you know, great. Not yeah. every seed always works out, but um, yeah. most of them have. Most of them have worked out fabulously. <clears throat> well, what's really great about them is, you know, they're open pollinated. Yeah. They will. Um, you can save the seed from them, and right. then you have the seed. And you don't have to keep buying it. You have to keep buying it, and um, and you can pass it on and share it in your community. Um, pretty neat. It's pretty neat. They're stuff. not. They're not copyright protected. No, which is amazing when you think about that. Seeds yeah. not copyright protected. I'm like, who would copyright protect seeds? <laughs> what kind of a person would do that? Not a person. Uh, oh. Yeah. A stack of papers would do that, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. A psychopath with a like a bunch of rubber stamps on it. Yeah. So it's not just food. They also have flowers, pollinators. They have some herbs and seed mixes. And let's see, what was I? You're going to point out a yeah, couple. couple of, the couple of uh, highlights. Uh, what was I salivating the most? Actually, was did the, we did we get our little um, not gooseberries? What were they called from there? Yes, uh, they're um, ground cherries. Ground cherries. We got our ground cherries from there. They also they have some seedlings they sell, uh-huh. and if you order them in time, they'll send you straight up seedlings, and you can just plant them on the ground. Cool. Yeah. Um, so what did they have? Oh, 
They've got some great melons. Oh, yeah. Some really amazing melons. Um, yeah, you've got pretty amazing melons. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> this is a family show. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. Uh, Charente, there, there's a, that's my favorite French melon. And actually, a lot of squashes that we enjoy here in the United States were cultivated widely in France to the point where they became, you know, more than you might expect from a pumpkin or a melon. We have a, we still have leftover from pre-Thanksgiving. We have a giant French pumpkin sitting in our f- uh, family room. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, what's the name of the Mousquet de Provence. Mousquet de Provence, yeah. and it's um, this bright orange, yeah. really thick walled pumpkin. Yeah. Lots of pumpkin meat. And you can you can roast it and slice it all up. You can freeze it, and then we have twice now taken just that pumpkin and blended it up with like a nice a a nice chicken broth or cream and it's absolutely fantastic creamy pumpkin soup yeah really delicious the meal by itself the uh our thanksgiving guest just uh just ate that up there like whoa more of that (laughs) yeah two kinds of ground cherries this year and um oh the greens i'm really they have a amazing selection of greens um, not just the other greens are arugula, silvetta, endive, but they've got like four or five kinds of romaine, and they've got about a dozen kinds of loose leaf, and then another dozen types of butterhead. Butterhead. Yep, and then that's, uh, a, that's a lettuce, right? Yeah, butterhead lettuce, okay. and then like these, they're more similar to iceberg. They form heads. Um, yeah, several kinds of. Um, Iceberg lettuce gets a bad reputation, but yeah. for some dishes like a it's, wedge salad, there's nothing there's tastier. Nothing else. There's nothing else. A little else. bacon and blue cheese. It's yeah, delicious. It's perfect. Um, oh gosh, another a dozen kinds of cucumber. Oh, yeah. oh my favorite. I, I really want to try this this year. I want to try the black Aztec uh, corn. Really? Yeah, I think is that the one. Oh yeah, it's, it makes it that makes a cornmeal, and there's another uh, dark. Corn. Oh, you want to grind it? Yeah, I want to grind oh, it. Oh yeah, it makes Who cornmeal. Did, uh, so yeah, Padraig did that. Our our friend in Saginaw, Padraig, grew this red corn. Yes, it's a red flint corn. It's red Italian variety. Red flint corn and, mm-hmm. and ground it. It's and, amazing. And what did we make out of that? Muffins or something? Oh, we made muffins. We made corn pudding. We it made, was so good. So good. Yeah. Um, I think the only things I did not make was tortillas. The thing is. If you take like this corn and grind it fresh, the difference in flavor between this fresh cornmeal and stuff that you'd have in a bin or off a shelf or from a mm-hmm. warehouse is just night and day. Night and day, or is a magnitude different? It's so sweet and and nice tasting, nutty, and just nutty several layers of flavor. creamy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then there's also blue jade. It's a it's actually a sweet corn you can grow it in containers. Is it blue? Mm-hmm. A blue sweet corn. So I'm gonna try those two this year. <laughs> the kids will be like, "Whoa!" I'm not eating that. Not eating that. <laughs> and then we'll have a few that are like, "Oh, more of that." Yeah. Corn. I'm eating it. Okay. Um, so yeah. So that's- we're gonna we're gonna try and do what we can to go in on a, a good garden project for 2018. Yeah, that's the plan. Because we didn't really get much done not in 2017 lot. with no. our new our new uh, backyard when we still have lots of things hanging over our head to unwind and, and figure and manage, out and figure manage out. doing what we can oh but, they also have a um i'm sure you guys have heard of moon and stars watermelon <clears throat> everyone's heard of that right they have yellow well, i have but i don't know if everyone has, has. um it's they, just a it's a small watermelon that's patterned with like different colored st- splashes of, of yellow of yellow yeah in the shape of a moon or little stars right yeah and they characteristically they have a one big splash in the you have to ones. harvest them by the light of the full moon or else they're poisonous that's, that's actually true, that's actually true. <laughs> uh, but no they've got a they have two varieties they have the uh, red flash and the yellow flashed moon and stars oh cool really nice okay so that's that's a uh, small, small watermelon are much tastier than these yes, enormous you know Cracked stunt thing. watermelon <laughs> A stunt is the word. <laughs> yeah, like how big can you grow? <laughs> how it? big can you go? So that's seed savers. Uh, highly recommended. Yeah, we'll put a link in. Yeah, we've gotten some amazing. So if you're if you're getting uh, feeling like you don't know what we're up to with the garden project, go back and listen to conversation ten yeah. from a couple of years ago where yeah. we did a tour, like a walking audio tour of our gardens. Yeah, and, that, and that's a good. I think a good starting point for where we're going to try. And go here. We're going to try and get back to that and then, right. you know, eventually 
beyond that. But yeah, well, that, that was kind of the zone. I mean, actually, we were getting there. We last were like summer, just we were just finally getting into like, hey, we have fresh produce all that summer long. long. That was amazing. It was a great. That was a great garden year. But <clears throat> yeah. even last year, though, we're moving and everything's crazy and yeah. et cetera, et cetera. I was harvesting from that garden. We still had it; still was producing a little. We're still food producing, for us. yeah, yeah. The various things that would reseed, yeah. and I never had to water. It was a really, it was key. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, otherwise, I've gotten three books recently: um, "Rip It," "The Sweater Chop Shop," and "Sweater Surgery." <laughs> I was. <laughs> Grace is opening a sweater clinic, or something like that, for your poor, sad, tired, and humble sweaters. So what's the idea of rip it? You take clothes and rip them apart? Yeah, rip them apart and maybe make them into new things. Really? Yeah, yeah. So like stuff, you, you know, it's out of style or something, you can restyle it and reimagine it. Or maybe it's torn or stained or you can repair it. Does it look like a quilt after that? Or It could. Actually, or what a, a lot of what her examples are... Turn t-shirts into bras, <laughs> like pants mm, into underwear. Mm. Well, a lot of... Uh, Veronica was pointing this out. A lot of the rip it one that's mostly sewing is um leans like like these punk and these really revealing sexy styles and yeah, you you're don't not into that we're not into that you know i'm not into that but you we don't, don't really want our our um 14 <laughs> year old daughter to be 13 year old daughter to be into that quite yet at least. And, and she doesn't seem to be into that for herself yeah but um those are her examples but what she's explaining how to do mm-hmm. is really quite universal Okay. Yeah, so there's a... And I, I think Rip It, which is the sewing one, which, and I'll admit my uh, my leanings, I have always leaned towards sewing and less towards knitting mm-hmm. and yarn craft. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm immediately more engaged in the sewing book than I am in the yarn and sweater books. Yeah. But the... Rip It Good. <laughs> how long are you waiting to make that joke? Who's the author? Oh, um... I was actually going to go through one by one. So yeah. Rip It is by Elisa uh, Myrich. And, um, Can you spell her last name? M-E-Y-R-I-C-H. And it's Elisa with two S's. E-L-I-S-S-A. Correct. Okay. Elisa Myrich. All right. Yeah. And it's how to deconstruct and reconstruct the clothes of your dreams. So maybe you've got this. And actually, I do, I do have a few things that have gone not like the fashion has gone out, you know? The fashion's went, gone out of them. Yeah, and they could like use a little styling. Out of a tire. <laughs> it's really flat. Um, and just to review, like what we cover in these, this book, um, she goes over the very basics, like the tools you need, the stitches you need, fabric terminology, mm. which was really great for me. There were a few passages on, like warp and weft. Mm-hmm. I confess, I've always had a hard time telling one from the other. <laughs> keeping, keeping, keeping it straight. Your, Keep, no, yeah. you're, she really knows her warp from her, her weft, weft. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to file some harassment charges against you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, I say, me too. Me too. What? <laughs> I'm just trying to have a podcast. <laughs> but the basics are: it's really it's stuff you probably learned in in high school home ec, but it's really good to have them reviewed and on hand and. It's always nice. I like lists. So I have to make a list of what I need to go get and what I need to have on my mm-hmm. hand stock. You do like lists. It's yeah. definitely true. <laughs> so I'm always texting you from Costco, like, Grace, do you have a shopping yeah. list for me? List. I usually do. Some, yes. weekend, some, some weeks I get a little distracted. Yeah. Uh, but then she goes over T-shirts and then sweatshirts and sweaters, remaking them, uh, pants, skirts, and then accessories, like making your purses, brooches, scarves, things like that. Um, and this, I think, this book is, I think, fairly well done. I'm not into her styles, but I think her instructions and her um, how-to information is really worthwhile. The ov- the overall concept is yeah. The is overall concept is really, sound, to you. really yeah, worthwhile. Cool. Um, yeah. So this is something I, again. I'd recommend this strongly, and um, for people who like to sew, if you're more and this is actually all of them. I should confess, actually lean strong on sewing and less on knitting. But the other two books are specifically about sweaters and reusing wool and knitted objects uh, to like maybe shrink them and and, um, felt them and then remake them into other things. So Sweater Chop Shop is my preferred... (laughs) Sweater Chop Shop. Yes, Sweater Chop Shop by Crispina. So tell you how to like replace the muffler. (laughs) Oh, actually, yeah, it kind of does. 
Um, by make it into a muffler. <laughs> by Crispina French with two Fs. So crisp Ina. Crispina. She, she's <laughs> she's from Vermont. How do you spell her first name? Crisp C R I S P. Ina I N A. The exciting new potato product from Frito Lay. <laughs> Look, I don't think we need to make Crispina's fun of this. Crispina's for her. <laughs> we don't need to make fun of this woman's name. This is just her name. Oh, come on. It's a funny name. It's a ridiculous name, but you All know, right. we don't need to talk okay, about her name. Okay, sorry. Sorry, Crispina. <laughs> and then French, French with two Fs. French with two Fs. That has to be a pseudonym. I hope it's a pseudonym. It's like Lloyd with two L's. Or, no, no. You, no, you say Le Lloyd. Le Lloyd. <laughs> That's what a character in or the like Ninjago. Alicia Bay, Alicia Bay Laurel, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so this maybe maybe it's not uh, a pseudonym. If it's not um, Ms. or Mrs. French, I, I apologize. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, your parents did that to you. <laughs> she may have married the name. I became I became Gray Spots <laughs> <laughs> on purpose. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> So this is also, I think this one is also very good. It's less uh, sewing heavy. Well, actually, no, it is It is sewing heavy. And she mostly hand sews. Um, but if you, um, I'm always a little bit afraid to deal with yarn. Yeah. And it always screws me up. And I'm really just, I'm just scared to use yarn. And I'm afraid I'm going to mess it up. So I'm a little more timid about the projects in this book. Whereas I feel a little more confident about using fabric. Okay. Um, but th- again, this is also, I think, very well laid out. And she um, talks about sweaters and talks has a brief chapter where she goes over what kind of materials you need, what kind of tools you need, etc. But then I actually, of the methodology, like how to teach you to do things, I like the way she has this laid out for teaching someone to do something. Mm-hmm. Best of all three books. Um, she starts with very simple projects, straight lines and squares. Cool. So you can ch- you know cut this out and you could... In an afternoon, you could do one project and be successful, yeah, and learn skills right out of the right out of the gate. I was Veronica interested in doing this with you. Actually, Joshua is. Oh, really? <laughs> do you remember at the bonfire at the mines? Yeah. He sat and hatched a plan to make all these knitted goods. He's plotting to take over the world. He is. He wants to start an online business and sell something through Etsy, but he didn't know what. Yeah, but he's doing something. And he specifically, he's leaning towards knitted goods and products and things like that oh, okay. and yarn, you know yarn work this and, is uh, how yeah this is how the kids get their first jobs yeah. becoming entrepreneurs <laughs> so he sat down with a couple of other girls around the campfire and just went to work and came up with an idea and they planned to have it open for the christmas season of 2018 really yes Oh, I look forward to seeing what the Indeed. happens. <laughs> so that's actually what inspired me to get these books. Especially if you can go to the like Goodwill or whatnot to pick up all your raw materials. Yeah, and frankly, I think if they're organized at all, yeah, they can get Goodwill to just give them their raw materials, whatever they got sure, to throw away. Right? Sure. So that's um, so this allows a young person or someone with a couple of thumbs like me to start do something and be successful. I hope and, you have a couple of thumbs. <laughs> well, but yeah, not much else. And then it's got, and this is what I thought was really good, is ways to basically take some old sweaters and make it into a whole new sweater. Mm-hmm. A whole new thing that's kind of reimagined and creative. So let's say you have this old shabby cardigan. You can turn that cardigan into like a zipped pullover. Oh. Yeah, like oh. with a hood and so on. Okay, I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys come up with. Yeah, and so yeah, it's got, it goes to several projects like that, and then other like little scrap projects. I'll be you your do. your guinea pig. Or, oh, uh, no offense to our Italian listeners. But. Hey, wait. <laughs> so that's that's the second book, Sweater Chop Shop, and um, again, highly recommend it. Now, Sweater Surgery. I don't mean to trash talk Sweater Surgery. It's also a nice book. It's by uh, Stephanie. S T E. Wait, wait, wait. You ready? <laughs> S T E F A N I E Gwen Stefani Stefani Stephanie Stefani Stephanie. 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 I'm thinking that's pronounced Stephanie Okay Gerard G I R A R D Oh her last name is a perfectly normal last name <laughs> It really is an ordinary regular last name This book um is a little lighter on instruction and how to um 
and you kind of have to piece together. I, I wasn't very satisfied with the how-to in this book. Mm-hmm. But what I think is really good in this book is she has some great examples. So if you want some inspiration or want to see, I mean, actually, that's the best part of this book. The photographs of the finished products, projects are great. Okay. They're really informative. So if like, you're having a hard time even imagining. Hang on, hang on, i got to interpret. Yeah. So if you're having a hard time like even imagining what something might look like, the projects are really well photographed so you can see a finished thing. In this photograph on page 52, a young woman is wearing a sweater which is, or a scarf which is pieced together. It looks like a quilt it's out patchwork. of yeah. wool squares uh, stitched together with very deliberately rough looking contrasting thread. Mm-hmm. And it looks like some of the thread at least is like a rainbow thread so it changes color as you proceed along the rows of stitches yeah so it's it, kind of cool it this one is actually kind of reminiscent of of uh the fourth doctor tom oh, baker yeah, doctor a baker scarf yeah okay let me do another picture real quick and yeah and actually the pictures are actually lacking in the other two books i, I felt like the pictures weren't as um weren't as strong uh on page 75 there are two, <laughs> this is called hippie chicks. Yes. There are two adorable little stuffed birds that look like they're made out of wool sweater fabric with little beaks stuck on them and wings. They're, they're like little sausages. <laughs> <laughs> they're pretty cute. I mean, if you like the kind they're of bright, thing, yeah. bright colors. There's also on the next page, there are two stuffed animals called Wooly Minky and Wooly Piggy. <laughs> so. I guess the, the okay. The, so, the neat thing about this is that you this is really just a jumping off point for your own yeah, ideas. For your own ideas. So whatever fabrics you have, I mean the whole the the thing that makes them charming is that nothing about them matches. Right. So whatever you have on hand, you could come up come up with something. So here's some pillows. Here's some placemats. Here's some oh a laptop cozy. Yeah, I thought that How was how contemporary. <laughs> Sweater with sassy new sleeves. Yeah. Oh, uh, an awesome embroidered bag. I know kids love that kind of thing. Oh, bags. Yeah. Okay, cool. Very pretty pictures. You're right. The pictures are, are, are fantastic. Yeah. And, that, and that's really, um, if you're like kind of looking for inspiration, I think this book is really good for that. Um, so that's what I'm working on right now and reading through. And uh, we'll see what, uh, what projects turn into what for... Uh, Joshua's we, adventure. we hope to have a walkthrough of what's going on in the garden. If we manage to continue oh, yeah. into 2018 properly, we would like to have maybe a periodic update of what we're getting out of the garden. Maybe we oh, that could be post cool. some pictures. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so that's the that's the reading and watching. Oh, I do have a little bit for watching. Yeah. So we are watching a TV show. <laughs> I don't even have to say what it is. This is a show that I watched back in the day as, what was I? I was 13, I think, or 12 or 13, depending on when in the year these episodes ran. Mm -hmm. And I actually gave up on it because of how unbelievably stupid it was. At 13. At 13. But uh, I've always, so I never finished this show never finished the episodes of this show yeah the show is like a spin-off follow-up to the original battlestar galactica yep called galactica 1980 in the future in this show the uh the fleet from battlestar galactica finds earth yep and things really go downhill from, from there, there. <laughs> It's bad. You don't need to watch. It's just Oh, it's funny though. Okay. Yeah, that, yeah, it's true. It's it funny. has its moments. It, the thing is it's it's yeah. not it's it's actually full of deliberate parody. Yes. But it's like they decided their idea was they would have a heavy dramatic uh, space opera show with a big plot arc and they would leaven it with like little bits of dr- parody. of parody. Right. But it doesn't really work that way. Well, they they were too they weren't they were too timid with the parody. Too timid with the parody. And, and too, too self-something. Too, like, too self-important you know, with the drama. Self-serious with the drama. Yeah. So the drama 
is stupid. The drama is really stupid. It's funny in places, but so like, it, no, it's so it's so stupid. It's actually funny. But the parody bits are funnier. The, the parody bits are funnier, and then they could be really funny. They can have great comedy comedic punch. Yeah, if they went ahead with it, just, just right. let themselves go. But with to it. me, it's almost what's fun about it. All um, actually is sitting there watching this like slice of literally 1980, which was at this point almost 40 years ago. Yeah. And just looking at the cars, the outfits, the phones, the conversation styles, what's on TV, what it's people like are eating capsule. in diners, it's kind of amazing yeah. to see. And then they're doing these, dropping in these little gags, like there's a little parody of Chips where they have two yeah. highway patrolmen. They went overboard pre- in the drama and stopped short to on the be, parody. Yeah, and they're acting like Chips. And then they even say, just to like elbow you in the ribs Maybe to make sure you it. get the joke is... Something like how come this never happens to those, to guys, those guys on, on TV? TV? <laughs> I think this was running. It may have been running at the same time or a year or two after Chips wound up. Yeah. I, I don't know, but it yeah. would have been very fresh mm-hmm. in the audience's mind to see these two highway patrolmen on motorcycles with sunglasses, like bantering with each other. You know. Right. Anyway, so there's bits like that, but the premises that they're throwing out. They're just pulling stuff out of their butts that they never used in the old show. Right. Like, like oh. The, it's the sweepings from the old show. They like yeah. off, the ideas off the floor. Yeah. So it's like, and, now that we're know. here, oh, look. No, if we fly fast enough around the earth, we can go backwards in time. It's like, oh, really? So you could have done that at any point, at any point previously, but didn't pull it that out until now, right? You have like, this ability. You could have avoided the Cylons altogether. You but, could have gone back in time and, and you know, undone the original attacks on Caprica and the whatever, you know, like the destruction but of their home planets. Didn't. But the, no one... Th- oh! Oh, we could have done <laughs> that. I could have had a V8. V8. <laughs> and that gag is like from Superman? Yes. Where he flies around the Earth to, Which I think to is rewind time. Either that year or... So, it was, uh, yeah, it was very or 80. close. It very was all close. close in. And then they're also like... Um, so that... The the plot of like the two uh um galactica guys on earth having dumb interactions with earthlings Earthlings is star trek the voyage home it's the plot of star trek the voyage Voyage home which i think they took from this i don't know which came came first first. Uh, it's just like there's just this stew of dumb tropes yeah that has been recycled and recycled yeah rehashed and a, and now there's like a Boy Scout troop of kids from the Galactica, and it turns out, oh, gravity on Earth is actually much lighter than it was on their home planets and on the Galactica. So the kids can jump 20 feet in the air. Ha ha. Uh-huh. What? <laughs> they just made that up. So they're doing that, and then they're also, um, I guess in the next episode, it becomes Bad, Bad News, News Bears. Bears. Yeah. So uh, it's it's really dumb, but... I showed the kids the first ones, and the whole thing where they're back in Nazi Germany, the kids found boring. Mm-hmm. But um, now that the, motorcycles were now that they're doing stuff with kids in like their scout troop and baseball team and all this, mm-hmm. um, they're like, "Hey, can we watch Galactica mm-hmm. again?" <laughs> and I'm like, oh, God. do we have to? <laughs> no, I wanted to see this because, like I said, I never finished the originals, and I at least am having fun just mystery science theater 3000ing the hell out of it yeah yeah so that that part is fun because it is so dumb and i I, i'm finally getting a chance to see just how dumb it got so yeah you couldn't bear it at the time yeah i was too uh too cynical (laughs) or something or something anyway so that's uh that's what we're reading and watching reading and watching yeah Okay. What's next? Oh, our walk a week. We took a walk last week. Walk a week. We took a walk last week. It was short. We did take a walk. Yep. I thought it was really good. It was good. Tell us. So we uh, went to downtown Ypsilanti. It ended up being like nightfall before we could get our act together. (laughs) We were going to mass and it was literally the last mass in the county. Last place in the county. This is all you got. This is what we got. So we um, went to downtown Ypsilanti. 
Oh, there's one more that's later. But that's like really, I really keep that in my back pocket just in case. Okay. It, it, all right. It wasn't it's literally like a, the latest, but it was a late. Like second was, to latest. Yeah, you know, 6.30, I think. Yeah, so, so it was 6.30 mass, and it's gotten dark, so we drove down and- We parked. Parked. On a side street. Like a mile away. Yeah, walked through downtown Ipsy. Walked through downtown Ipsy, through Depot Town, <clears> by the co-op, <throat> and by all these- and there's some really sweet restaurants in Depot Town. Yeah. Over the river. Through the woods. Well, by the firehouse, <laughs> anyway. And um, then up to St. John the Baptist in uh, Ypsilanti. Yep. It's, which is a beautiful, beautiful church building. It is. And they have a nice, quiet, meditative uh, chant before the service, which our children... Um, ruined. Ruined. <laughs> For everyone there. <laughs> really in every respect. Yeah. In yeah. every respect. It yeah. was... It was impressive. It was a little grim. <laughs> but the, we but we had a good service done I'm like ourselves. Literally two tooth enamel is falling out of my mouth and like grinding my, <laughs> my teeth. teeth so hard. <laughs> but but you know, we all survived. Yep. We made our way through mass and then oh poor poor little Eleanor got chilled on the walk. Oh, we had so, her we had her in the backpack and you know, it wasn't sure. that cold. It wasn't cold. But it got windy but over it, the river. Over there a stiff breeze kinda came up and right. she didn't have gloves on. Right. She and so she, she was wearing a snowsuit, but she didn't have little gloves on. And her little hands got red, and she was like, wait a minute, I'm experiencing pain for the first time Don't, in my what life. What happened? <laughs> so she was just disconsolate, just, you know, yeah, for... Livid. And mad. Mad, really mad. So she had to complain for a good 20 minutes before she finally like, down. okay, I'm fine now. Fine. Just needed to, to protest. To protest. So we... But on the way back... <laughs> We got her all together. Well, you wrapped her up in a scarf around her hands, and then I took yeah. my sweater off, and we bundled her up, up in that, sweater. too, right, tied until that she was like a little... A little, 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 little Inuit baby, like in her little like fur. I was thinking like a little zombie with her. She couldn't move her arms. or oh, just kind of yes. stuck stiffly out in front of her. She's like, Mom, Mom, is this okay? She's giving like, me this look. No, no, this is fine. It's be good. But as soon as... We as, got as soon as we got moving with her in this configuration, she was so bundled up that she just fell asleep. She just fell asleep. Zonked out. So it zonked completely out and stayed asleep because we stopped at yeah. a great place. Yeah, we went to, yeah, Maze. We went to a, a new, not brand new, but pretty new-ish, new-ish restaurant uh, in, in Depot, Depot Town called Maze uh, Mexican food. Yeah, I was impressed. Well, it started out a little weird really because impressed. the kids knocked over... <laughs> The, the waitstaff set up our table with all our waters and corn chips and everything, and then somehow the kids climbed on the table and it collapsed and collapsed. sent corn chips and water like flying all over. So like, did, did Bilby like slide onto the floor? Uh, into the- his like D- Bilby fell off, landed on his back. Like, oh, huh, what happened? What happened? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Now the best part is. I stepped away to go to the bathroom. You, you went to the bathroom, and when you came back, our table was literally in ruins. <laughs> it's like, what? How? <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Like, and I'm, I'm looking nonchalant, like, oh, doesn't, yeah. whatever. I don't care anymore. <laughs> Jesus. But no, nobody was hurt. Nobody was hurt. The, 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 technically, the, I don't think it was actually our children's no, fault the, i think the table they, lake was not actually attached or something the tabletops are made out of particle board and they had these legs bolted into them and when we were looking at it the one was all like chewed up and torn out yeah and it was not it, it was not stable it was not stable so if you give it even a little nudge sideways it just collapsed collapsed right and yeah i think billy was leaning <clears throat> heavy on it trying to get some more corn chips yeah like climbing across the table <laughs> yeah you know the usual as one does Which, yeah so, uh, but after that, after that, after they swept up literally the the uh, snow drifts of corn chips from the floor off to the sides and um, yeah. gave us some more chips more and everyone chips. got seated again. Reseated. Uh, the food was very good. Yeah, outstanding. So actually, we can recommend this place. Um, it's a little like the atmosphere and all that is a little, I don't know, gentrified like. The, or a lot, actually. A lot gentrified, kind of, you know, yeah. low, low brow, high brow, like up upscale brow or something. I don't know. Yeah, no, like they're they're it's clearly upscale, but they're they're a hole in the wall, <laughs> <laughs> like that. But the food was actually the food actually was actually good. surprisingly good. And I will say the reason actually I really wanted to go in. I expected the food to be much more bland and corporate tasting. You know? Yes, but it's it was, not a chain. I don't think. Oh, it's not a chain. It doesn't appear to be a chain. <clears throat> and the food was very good. Uh, yeah. the, clearly, they 
care about their ingredients. Yeah. But the reason I came in the door is because Sundays, children <laughs> eat free. Sundays, children eat, eat free food. with some restrictions. But, yeah, um, it ha- you know, it has to be from the children's menu. You yeah, have yeah, to be yeah. like, per adult, you can have two kids get free children's menu meals. Right. Uh, and not all our kids wanted to eat from the children's kids menu, menu, but we got like like three or four, you know, the kids, like yeah. three or four of the kids got free meals for the when you know the rest like we bought like four regular four meals. regular meals yeah yeah so it that was out well that was a deal because it's not a it's not a low cost restaurant it wasn't super expensive but yeah I, I, yeah I, I think medium yeah medium not cheap not expensive yeah and the moderate uh, price the what do you remember what the oh the burrito I had was a oh, barbacoa yeah beef I, barbacoa beef barbacoa, beef barbacoa burrito. Yeah, and it had roasted potatoes in it and beef and um, a little green chili sauce in there. And we got we got them without dairy, and you got yours without dairy too. Yeah, I got chili relleno without dairy, which is it seems like that would ruin it. But both of these were really good. Really they good. had enough like the fundamentals had enough flavor that you could take away the extra like cheese and sour cream and right. whatnot and focus on the sauces and all that. And they were still so, really good. Still really quite good. Um, the, the children liked. Joshua got a fish taco. He really liked that. Yeah. And I forget what the other kids got, but they seemed happy. Pippin got a, a grilled cheese. <laughs> also known as a quesadilla. A quesadilla. We told him it was a grilled cheese. And like, oh, okay. Okay. That was funny because he usually doesn't. Doesn't. He's nope. like, this is not a grilled cheese. Well, right, actually, you know, Pippin's the one who's like, like this evening we had that chicken with the, the yeast on it, mm-hmm. the nutritional yeast. Yeah. And, he's, and um, he loved it. But if you tell him there's nutritional yeast on it, he's like, "What? I'm, I'm, not never, I'm never eating food again. No, you betrayed me, mother." Yeah. <laughs> but no, he he loved it. He thought it was great. He, yeah. He's got sort of like a, a comfort zone with food that he can't violate. He's, he's a fussy eater, and we keep hoping that this is a stage and he'll grow out of it right? and get right? a little more adventurous. But he's Sam mostly still did. a really fussy eater. Sam mostly did. Yeah. Joshua did. Yeah. No, he's ordering the. I'd like the fish tacos with the chili, green chili, chili cilantro, yeah. and you know. The- yeah, so he he you know he got past it. I'm hoping we get to the day where Pippin gets past it. Uh, that may be in vain, but there we are. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you know we rounded up the the crew after we finished, head back to the car, and that was that. That was our walk. It, it was a really eclectic walk. It was an eclectic walk. It was about mm, eighteen hundred calories. <laughs> Consumed, not burned. Consumed. Yes, consumed. <laughs> so probably a net loss as far as fitness and all that. But, but yeah, um, overall it, net gain. It turned out to be a nice evening, even if you. The only downside that really like left me traumatized was the screaming children at the at mass. <laughs> that was hard. Even the collapsing tables. I'm kind of like I've been doing this parenting thing for a while now. I'm kind of like, oh. all right, anyone bleeding? Okay, stop screaming. No, just get up. (laughs) Yeah. 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 So it was, what did I say we were driving home with you? I'm going to say it was an 85% good evening. (laughs) Any any outing with the children (laughs) that you can all walk away from is a good outing with the children. (laughs) No one needed a cast. No one needed a cast. (laughs) Tourniquet. (laughs) Not even, you know, like an ER visit. Not even an ice pack. Right. No, we were good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now we've got a few. We, what, we have we have three topics. Yeah, three three topics. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you yeah, a uh, nice way. To, uh, a nice way to put them. Yeah. Social security. Yep. Sartre. Yep. Self care. Yeah, I'm going to go with it. Let's do it. Okay, that order? Yeah, we can, we, can start, we can do that order. Okay. The Social Security topic is me basically getting fed up with the stuff I'm reading online, on Twitter particularly. Yeah. And here's I what... I that. I'll, I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll say what it is and then say what I agree with and what I disagree with and why it's why I think it's important yeah. to make this distinction. I'm sorry, I'm just you know, tearing you on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, these are... People, I'm quoting from Twitter and various headlines. Um, Here's a headline. Republicans are going after Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and ACA because the GOP believes they are, quote, entitlements, unquote. 
And then I see responses like, let's be clear, Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security are social contributions and investment programs. Americans directly invest in Medicare and Social Security. See another tweet. Social Security and Medicare are not entitlements, but earned benefits. Entitlements is a Republican way of framing this issue negatively, and NPR shouldn't fall for it. It's a response to an NPR story, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And another one. Social Security and Medicare are not entitlements. We pay into them. Okay. And you see a lot of this. Uh, especially framed in the in the wording like, I paid Social Security my whole life, and now it's time for me to get that money back. It's mine. It's mine. Okay. Now, here's my point. <laughs> yes, let's hear your point, Paul. Social Security, uh, this talk, I'm talking mostly about Social Security, but also about the other programs. Yes. Okay. So I'm just going to say Social Security. It is an entitlement. Yes. It is not a pension plan. Yes. And that's a good thing. Yes. And that's what makes the program a radical piece of socialist social engineering and yes. why we should defend it. As an entitlement. When you talk about it as if it was a pension plan and a system by which you basically invest your own money and then in retirement you get your own money back, that is a lie. And it also makes it un uh, special. It makes it not special, not radical, and easy to say, well, why don't we just put all that money in Wall Street? Because yeah. they could get a better return. A return for your money. For your money. And that's the angle that the Republicans are pushing. That's the angle. So yeah. when you say Social Security is not, a re- is not an entitlement, Social Security is an, a pension scheme, Social Security is my money, you're, right. pr- you're, you're playing into the hands of the people who are trying to privatize the program. Yes. It's a rhetorical game. Yes. It's a rhetorical game. And... We appear to be losing? <clears throat> we are losing. Because, because I see so many people who don't actually seem to know how the program is structured and funded and how the benefits work. Yes. So I'm gonna um I'm gonna talk a little unpack this a little bit here. Yeah, go for it. So <clears throat> we should oppose Republican attacks on Social Security. Oh and, I, I I do want to say one thing. I I get the sentiment that we shouldn't have Social Security and these other programs taken from us. Yes. I, I agree with that sentiment. Yeah. Um, but they actually are entitlements. Right. And that's, you, you, they're saying entitlement like that's a bad thing. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, we should support these programs because they work and because we deserve them. Yeah. Not because we have earned Earned-ed. them necessarily. It's not about earning it. So let's make sure we use accurate language to talk about these programs and don't spread misunderstandings that actually demean and diminish the programs and make them easier to destroy. Let's talk about them accurately so we don't forget that these programs are actually socialist programs and that's why they work. Yeah. Let's not divide people with the framing that certain people are entitled to these entitlement programs because they paid into them. Which, that's not how they work. That's not how they work, and that's a lie about it is, our value. It is a little bit how they work, but I'll unpack that. Okay, Social Security is not a retirement fund that you personally pay money into and from which you personally get back the money you paid into it. Right, nope. It's not this. It was never set up this way. And if you f- uh, frame it or think about it this way, you're softening people up to treat it like a 401k. Right. And then you can privatize it. There actually was a Supreme Court case, if you don't believe me, Fleming v. Nestor, 1960. Mm -hmm. And part of the text of that result, no one has a, quote, accrued property right to benefits from Social Security. Now, the context was um, the U.S. was expelling a foreign national who was a member of the Communist Party. And he was suing because he's paid into Social Security for many years. And I wasn't going to get anything. And wasn't going to get anything. Right. So that's a terrible context. Yeah. Right. But the decision was correct. And the case said the non-contractual interest in their decision of an employee covered by the act 
cannot be soundly analogized, analogized, analogized. to that of the holder of an annuity whose right. right to benefits are based on his contractual premium payments. Right, because that's not what he was doing. <clears throat> he was not paying into his own... Right, his own right. retirement right. account. FICA right. is not a system where employees pay into their own retirement front fund. Employers actually split the tax burden, right? Mm-hmm. But people don't talk about how they should get half that money back. No. Right. It's a, actually a regressive tax that unduly burdens self-employed people Yep. and does not fairly collect from high earners. But those are side issues. The main point is not a simple payment scheme. Mm-hmm. You don't pay into your program in advance. Instead, Social Security, as we usually think about it, is mostly a payment scheme where current workers and their employers pay money into the system while current beneficiaries collect payments out of the system. Right. There are some qualification requirements, and you get something that looks like a statement periodically that says you're eligible for it if mm-hmm. you've put enough money in. Right. And that's true. Mm-hmm. But that And that sort of, all of these trappings are sort of designed to make people feel better about how this isn't socialism. Right. Right. It's sort of straight up socialism. But go on. It's like the only thing we do that's straight up socialism. But go on. Yeah. Uh, if this was true, um, it's not straight up, but I'll, I'll get to that. Hey. If this was true, we would not have a system that could immediately begin supporting people when it went into effect. Right. You'd right. have to wait. <laughs> now, this is a, people may not know this happened historically. The, and this is the part that I mean is straight up socialism, is that you know, people started getting benefits sure. right away right. when they hadn't paid anything in. The first monthly payment was issued on January 31st, 1940 to Ida May Fuller of Ludlow, Vermont. In 1937, 38, and 39, she paid a total of $24.75. Just let that sink in for a moment. Mm-hmm. Three years time. Eight into the Social Security system. Or per year, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Her first check was for $22.54. Mm-hmm. After her second check, oh, actually, that was a total over three years. Yeah. After her second check, Fuller already had received more than she contributed over the three-year period. Yeah. She ultimately, this woman, reached her 100th birthday. Mm-hmm. She lived another 35 years. Right. Dying in 1975, and she collected a total of $22,888.92 from the program. What, yeah, it was 20, uh, 2475. Mm-hmm. That was wasn't yeah. interest. That wasn't interest. <laughs> he wasn't gay. <laughs> Woo, that interest really piles yeah, up. No. <laughs> no, no, no. That's, that's a joke. When I was growing up, uh, my mother received on my behalf Social Security money under the aid to dependent children part of the program. Yes. I had not earned any money at that point. No. But I, needed, I did need to get my Social Security card. Mm-hmm. when I was 12 or so. Um, right. And we got that because our family was low income. Yes. <laughs> you know what? You know, this, is the, this is the other thing. This was funny. Yeah. Right. Right, so you were like 12 years old. You hadn't put anything into it. Right. But, you know, you were entitled to that money. I was entitled to that money. Because? My family was entitled, entitled to, to that, that money. money. Why? My mom because received the income on our behalf for, right. for our care and for benefit. For your care and benefit. And you know who else got that exact same benefit? What was that? In childhood. Oh. Paul Ryan. <laughs> it was a good benefit. And you know what? You what? Know what? He was entitled to it. He was entitled to it. In the United States, Social Security is the commonly used term for, it's called the Federal Old Age Survivors and Disability Insurance, mm-hmm. OSADI, or sorry, OA, OA, this is why you call it Social Security. <laughs> <laughs> OASDI. OASDI. <laughs> OASDI. Yeah, no, Social Security. <laughs> the original Social Security Act was signed into law by President Roosevelt in 1935. This is from Wikipedia. And, well, that's not a good source. No. <laughs> and the current version of the act, as amended, encompasses several social welfare and social insurance programs. Right. My note, originally considered an insurance program, Mm-hmm. designed to insure people against impoverishment due to circumstances, including living into old age without sufficient assets or income to avoid impoverishment. Yeah. And, it, of course, at that time, not quite so many people lived into old age after they were... After age 65, but yeah, it, it happened. <clears throat> it did happen. 
Mm-hmm. And it happened early on in the system. Oh, I may want to make an interjection here about insurance. Yeah. Yeah. I, I say this often, and people always give me this look like, yeah, yeah she's always been off her rocker. <laughs> but um, insurance, right. I know it's part of the fire industry. Yeah. But independent of that, it is fundamentally a social good. Is it the legal way- to scream theater in a crowded... Never mind. Stop. Go on. Um, it's a social good. It's inherently spreading risk amongst a group that's what insurance does that's what especially, insurance does. especially health insurance but all all insurance really. all insurance spreads risk and, th- th- and actually this is the reason i've always said that health insurance is a bit of a scam mm-hmm. because if you know you're going to go to the doctor that's not a risk yes that's a planned expense what you want to socialize is the risk a, yes so the things that you don't expect to happen the things that you don't yeah. anticipate having to pay for that's what needs to be socialized and spread over a large group. Sure. Uh, you know what? If more of us had a reasonable income, I think I would be down with making our universal health care entirely about um, expenses over and above like some basic floor or base, right, you know, basic right. ceiling of... They're like, you know, you're going to spend this much on health care yeah, in a given year. Yeah. But we have so many people now who are very low income right. and vulnerable that mm-hmm. it can't be that. No, we can't function that way. Or too that's, many people just die. Just die. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that that's just an interjection about how insurance is yes. uh, socialization of risk. Yes. It's socialized risk. That's all insurance really is. Yes. And it doesn't actually make sense for someone to profit off that. No. So carry on. Okay. So anyway, uh, it is true there is a trust fund. Yep. Trust fund was designed to smooth out the amount of money available for paying out to current recipients when demographics change. Right. And in in essence, as the the um, the uh, rhinoceros moves through the python, yes, the boomers move through their their years. Um, mm-hmm. They saw this coming a long way off. I said, yeah. I mean, anyone and, could see this coming, right? And knew that there was going to be a shortfall. Right. In current receipts versus outflows, right? In the and so established a trust fund to smooth that over. In other words, when there was a lot of money coming in, they put some of that aside, right? For when there wouldn't be as much money coming in because of demographic shifts. Now the trust fund is not cash; it's not invested exactly. No, nope. it's a series of non-marketable U.S. Treasury securities held by the Social Security Administration. Correct. It is by law backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. A number of years ago during the George W. Bush administration, he was disparaging this. He did some kind of a stunt on camera where he went into office and said, there's no money here, opened up a drawer and was pulling out like these securities statements or or these um, government bonds that are what the trust fund is and saying, this isn't money, this is just a, a useless piece of paper. And he I have was a for you out yeah, there. <laughs> Jesus Christ. He was disparaging the full faith and credit of the yeah, Uni- United States government. government. That was actually an act of treason, treason. to be yeah, doing that. To, to do that, yeah. To that's be stopped. saying that the bondholders of this paper, this government bond, government security, right? Not bond, I guess. Um, uh, Has no value. Have, have, don't have something of value, right? That's a poisonous and deadly meme to be spreading about our country because like you say, because that's what money is. Yeah, that's what money is. That's what money is. Right. It's it's in a different form, Yeah, but it's essentially what money is. So implications. Social Security was actually a socialist program. It was designed to mimic at a national level the kind of support that traditional families provided for their elders in old age. Right. That everyone who was working would support the people who could no longer work. This traditional support had nothing to do with investing anyone's income in Wall Street. No. It was not a pension program. Right. And let's be clear. You didn't have to earn it. Most people did not invest money up until recently. Right. So this wasn't something like because of your virtue, because of something you did – no, it's what you got by being an elder a in this community. By being a person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it involved current earners assisting their elders and other dependents, not just elders, right? by providing for their needs, including housing, food, and medicine. Yep. So 
Why Social Security? Well, because it was created and implemented at a time when the financialization of the economy and the subsequent bubble and collapse of that financialized economy Fire industry. collapsed, uh, made it so that families, lots of families, lots of families, had suddenly lost the ability to meet the needs of, of the their room. elders and dependents right. in a large swath of the population. Right. About 25% of the population. That's why. And again, as you mentioned before, when talking about Sanders' ideas, mm -hmm. this was literally the least they could do to uh, keep yeah. people from burning the cities, right. from Just tearing, rioting, the rioting, from burning government buildings, to the you ground. know, from right. pulling out the guillotines and going to the barricades because they were starving. Right. The very least. <clears throat> <sighs> Rampant capitalism had destroyed the family system. Mm -hmm. And so after the Great Depression, socialist initiatives were put in place to try and keep people alive and meet their minimal needs, again, as we said, to prevent people from feeling that the system had lost all moral legitimacy. Right. Yeah. So, Which, you know, just to be clear, it has. But moving on. There are some publications that are... Th th this happens every few years, yeah. right? I've heard this before. I've had these arguments before and made them with people before. Right. Usually conservatives who really believe that somehow that when they pay into Social Security, that, that it's their money, that it's gone into a fund that has their name on it, that it's accruing interest somewhere and in they cash, and they're going to get that money back and no other, you know? Right. They literally seem to believe that. And I have this argument every few years saying, that's not how the program's structured, and that's why we can't. But now we're having those conversations with liberals. <sighs> and some leftists. It's like this... This ignorance is continuing to spread. Yeah, no. But you know, here we're we're going to put a stop to it. Stops here. Yeah. So some people are writing well about this. So the Atlantic had a piece, and I'll link to the piece. Um, even I'm quoting even before the newly minted GOP tax plan passed the Senate, adding a whopping 1.5 trillion to the national debt in order to give away the store to corporations and the wealthiest Americans. These lawmakers were already quote, discovering, unquote, that their own profligacy requires bringing down the deficit by, you guessed it, cutting entitlements. Folks, this happens every few years. Every years. Right. Come on. Speaker Paul Ryan announced, uh, quote, we're going to have to get back next year at entitlement reform, which is how you tackle the debt and the deficit. That's a lie. <laughs> it is. It's a big lie. And if it's a... Uh, What's the, who's the the big lie theory you repeat it over and over, over again, again? People start to, to believe, believe it. it. Yeah. Is that Goebbels? I, I want to say it's Goebbels, but you know you it's, can't believe everything you read on the internet. Yeah, and we're not going full. Uh, not going full Godwin. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I actually what I like to the one I really like to quote is Mark Twain. You know, that's they're honest lies and they're dishonest lies. Yeah. That's a dishonest lie. Absolutely. He's a, yeah. So he, really he said this. I'm quoting. Even as he began negotiations with his Senate counterparts over exactly how much they're gleefully going to increase the very same debt and deficit with the tax bill. Yeah. Right. And this, yes, and the so we say entitlements are a problem. They're a big hole in the budget. They're a big, no, the way we're managing, managing the entitlements is a problem yeah. and a hole in the budget. The way we're treating them as a political football is That's a, a problem. problem and a big hole, hole in the budget. budget. Yeah, but there's no problem with the entitlement program. It's actually. not. Uh, continuing to quote, Democrats and most Americans will rightly resist such a cynical gambit, but that leaves the very real challenges of the deficit entitlements in the future they largely will frame still unresolved. Failure of leadership, is my commentary, failure of leadership. Oh, we told failure. Planned and wanted failure of leadership. Yeah, yeah. And continuing to quote, the fundamental problem is that Social Security and Medicare were sold to the public on a fiction and until Americans grapple with that, they're unlikely to achieve a consensus on fixing the programs. Wait, so wait what fiction was it sold The fiction the that they're investing oh. their money. Who, who, who said that? I'll get there. Okay. I don't, I don't think FDR said that. If FDR's America was a place where it was dangerous to grow old, it was also a country unaccustomed and resistant to large-scale income transfer programs. Social Security, therefore, was designed to look like and sold as simply a government-administered pension program, not welfare in any way, shape, or form. The program was supported not by the progressive income tax, but by 
payroll deductions, making it a separate tax, implied that it was a pension contribution. Right, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. making an employer portion of it. Well, that's how my four hundred one k works right now. So, yeah, yeah, that was modeled after. Oh, your employer is also kicking in something to your pension. Right, right. Americans yeah. were given social security numbers looking like a bank account number, and they're still sent regular statements. I think you get an annual statement of their yeah. quote contributions and projected payouts on mm-hmm. those supposed savings look like and medicare the way the paperwork looks for medicare is crafted to give you the exact same impression that you're paying for that you're paying for a specific thing for your future right however it it implies a contract that doesn't exist yes so fdr did say this in i don't know the fdr said it but the the program looked like this the program implies it strongly Yeah. yeah 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 the average medicare recipient receives treatment totaling the full amount of his or her lifetime contributions plus a market rate of return within the first two years after retirement. Yeah. You don't pay nearly enough into the system to pay what an average person actually requires. From Medicare. From Medicare. Yeah. Uh, After that, it's all income transfer from other Americans. Yeah. Yeah. Over the remaining years of life, the average retiree can expect to receive Social Security benefits amounting to roughly 30% bonus because Social Security payments haven't gone up as fast as health care expenses, right? 30% bonus over what she paid into the system plus interest. That 30% bonus is all from Americans who are currently working. Well, actually, all of it is from Americans yes, who are we're currently, currently working, working unless yeah. they also draw down the trust fund. But Right. And you don't want to do that unless it's actually necessary. Yeah. Anyway, so what's the actual crisis? I'm, again, I'm quoting. From, um, Our entitlement system was designed to fund current generations out of the taxes of younger and future generations while pretending not to. Yes. This intergenerational compact not only made sense, but also worked when working Americans were largely in far better financial shape than senior citizens. Right. Right. So the people with jobs had more money than senior citizens. citizens. Right. Which is why the seniors needed help. Right. Uh, where am I? And population growth and economic, don't say it, progress went more or less hand in hand in steady progression. But not only is the elderly poverty rate no longer 50%, it was 50%, 50%. right? right. Now it's 10%. Mm -hmm. The wealthiest, highest income age cohort is now boomers nearing retirement. Yeah. And the second wealthiest are those in in retirement. In retirement. Now, I'm not using this to jump on the boomers and say, well, they deserve it. (laughs) To say they, they, uh, politically, they have it coming. But as people... I'm not going to say they don't deserve their retirement. Their retirement. No. They don't deserve the assets they've received. The rest of us do too. The rest of us do too, right? So the second wealthiest cohort of people are those already in retirement. Already in retirement. So yeah. uh, who's not doing well in the current economy? The people who are supposed to be paying Social Security the young, benefits. Younger Americans. Younger all Americans. the people behind them paying into the system to keep the system operating. Right. It was not designed under the assumption that, oh, by the way, income inequality is going to inflate in an absolutely insane and Demented. unforeseen way. Right. And we're going to rebuild not only the Gilded Age, but we're going to go past that into the feudalism. <laughs> <laughs> Trade feudalism. Let's go. Do it. Make so- it so... So I'm not really ready to talk about all the fixes, but one fix would be raising the the cap on the payroll tax. Absolutely. And that fix itself would be enough to fix most of the projected funding problems yeah. into the foreseeable future. Which only makes sense because uh, to cap it at a number uh, yes. and not at an index exactly. is perverse. Well, it's 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 not inflation indexed. It's not cost of living no. adjusted by law. So yeah, because we're, cause we're so talking about something that was a cap. Make any sense. It was a cap when right. people were earning, you know, what two well, bucks an hour. And remember that woman who put in twenty five dollars. Right? right. That was a lot of money back. That's a lot then. of money back then. Um, not anymore. Right. Um, 
it really needs to be capped somewhere in the 200s or maybe 400, Yeah, honestly. Yeah. And that would make up for an enormous amount of the shortfall. Absolutely. Um, we can't have an honest conversation about how to fix the program if we don't understand and talk honestly about how it currently works and how it was meant to work. How it was meant to work. Oh, so when you say it's not straight up socialism, you're referring to its trust uh, fund. The trust. Oh, you're referring to the trust fund and to like the its trappings. The trust the fund itself trappings. and the fact that well, some people do. You know, people are paying in. Right. And it depends on people paying in. Plus the trappings of it looks like a pension fund. It looks like a pension fund. Right. And there's also the trust fund. But people yes. paying in. Right. Um, that's the, that's the socialist program. That's a socialist yes. program. Yeah, yeah. I'm mostly referring to the trust fund. The, the fact that it has it does have money invested in a, in a way. In a way. Does mean it's not strictly speaking just a current. It's not strictly speaking current workers pay for current. Uh, beneficiaries. beneficiaries. Yeah. I was going to say retirees, but, but it's not just retirees. No, it's not just retirees. Right. And so that. Um, and a lot of people get these benefits who aren't retirees and didn't and may never pay have into the system for may their never, whole working lives. Right. But, and including there's children. <laughs> and yeah. housewives. Yes, yes, yes. Who spent their whole spouses, spouses spent right. their whole lives working? They still get money from the system in old age, right? As they don't have, they a, should. They don't get the statement that says how much they put into it every year if they're not earning income, every year. right? Cash income. But actually, I still get a statement. Do you? Yeah. Oh, I've never seen it. Well, you know, it's addressed to me. <laughs> Okay. In particular, do not fall into the trap of using Republican framing and Republican terminology and Republican talking points when you're talking about Social Security. Don't defend it with those, those talking points right. because that frame and those talking points and those terms make it sound like something that could be easily replaced and handled better by the private sector. And there's no way the private sector is up to this task. No. None. And that actually completely undoes the the real radical agenda and the whole point of the program. Right. And turns it into just a, a 401k system. Right, which, and I don't know if people may, may understand why that's actually bad. <clears throat> because the point isn't um, to give people what they deserve. Yes. The point is to give people what they need. Yes. And don't ever confuse that. Or to or to put it another way, people everyone deserves what they need. Precisely. Precisely. Yes. Yeah, it's not it's not about giving you what you earned fair and square. It's about you being deserving of having your needs met. Yeah. Yeah. Full stop. You're a human being, you live here, and you deserve to have your needs met. And you know, People talk about how a conservative approach would keep this kind of support in your local community and in the local family and all this, but um, conservative policies destroy those families and destroy their income, destroy their earning power, destroy their communities. That's why I don't describe those policies as conservative. <laughs> So-called conservative <laughs> So-called policies. conservative policies. And that's why we needed... That's why this ever needed to exist. Why we needed a new deal... It's because the old one was pretty raw. The old one was pretty raw. 50% poverty among seniors. Yeah, that's a raw deal. That's a raw deal. And so, so that said, So right? maybe, you know, maybe this is an ideal in the sense that, I, you know, ideally families would be able to take care of their own. Ideally. But the way to fix that, if that's not happening, is not to pull away all the support. All the, yeah, no, no, that's not actually... Not actually helpful because I mean, you saw that photo I was, I, I circulated about this ninety-three-year-old woman who couldn't afford her nursing home anymore, so oh, they yeah. evicted her. Yeah, and when she wouldn't leave, the police came and arrested her and, and had her in cuffs. Yeah, they had her this arms woman are bruising because her, her her skin is like tissue paper. And know? they've got her in the lockup in an <sighs> orange jumpsuit for like forty-eight hours. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, we should be ashamed collectively. We, collectively, that's a, that's a shit. I mean. It's, I can't even speak. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's just a horror. That's where we're headed. But here we are. When we get rid of entitlements. Because 
don't make the mistake and think that you aren't entitled to your basic dignity. <laughs> Yet you aren't entitled to your, have your basic needs your met. Need, especially you are. The, especially the, the vulnerable. Especially. Young especially and old, the vulnerable. But everyone. But everyone. And now that's the thing. You can't ever start using entitlement like it's a dirty word. Right. It's not as... And also this, this whole... Can you just keep in mind when we're talking about people earning money in their retirement to keep themselves alive. This is not a ceiling. This is just a floor. It's a floor. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it's just so absurd. That, yeah. But but here we are. We're having this conversation. But okay. yeah. So but when you're talking about Social Security, please do watch your language. And I don't mean, you know. Oh, yeah. No, curse all you need to. Curse all you need to. But yeah. be aware of, of how the program works and and the right way to defend it versus basically undermining it by by making claims about it that aren't even true. I, I think this is the thing that I, I, just to piggyback that, you don't need to pretend that it's not a socialist program. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can, but pretending it's not a socialist only, program, that's only... Here's, here's the thing, in 2017... Undermines it. That attack doesn't work anymore. No. Even doesn't. among Trump voters. It doesn't work anymore. They're like, I'm well, socialist. we've been suffering for a long time why don't we try a little socialist fairy dust and see what happens happens. i mean it's fairy dust right i don't think you know like red baiting really is still a convincing (laughs) there are some folks who won't drop it who won't let it die there are there are but let them shout themselves blue in the face and then just make fun of them make you know and work around them right all right Next. Next topic. Sartre? I don't. I didn't mean for this to be so epic. I thought it would go a little quicker, but um, we get yeah. to talking. So this is um, about an essay written by Jean-Paul Sartre. I can't pronounce it right. It's okay. Close we know who you're enough. About. It's close enough. Uh, in 1973, called good year. Elections, a Trap for Fools. And I re- started reading this in a collection of essays by Sartre, um, from New York Review of Books called We Have Only We Have This One Life to Live. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was blown away. I've never read this essay. And I was just like looking at the title, like, oh, that seems interesting. And I started reading it. And I started reading bits of it out loud to you. And then I started going, whoa. whoa. <laughs> like, Wait, read that again. Every few sentences, I'd be like, whoa. I'd read it out loud to you. And then I'd back up and read it again. Like, okay, let's keep going. Right, right. And, um, Rarely has uh, an essay about politics or society what had such a galvanizing effect on me, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Um, because I believe he was, uh, what what he's done is write a kind of radical analysis of how electoral politics works, yes. and worked in France in 1973, mm-hmm. and it was to call it incisive is an understatement. <laughs> an understatement. <laughs> it like digs out the root chops it up on a cutting board and spreads it out and lays it there for you and points at it and says see see you're like holy shit (laughs) i guess i do now i should say uh i don't i'm not necessarily convinced that i fully understand all his points Mm -hmm. because they're uh, part of it i think is that this was translated literally from french Right, and that some of this, some of the sentence structure might be a little more lucid in French, but I don't read French very well at all. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, yeah, there's idioms that don't. There's idioms that maybe didn't translate fully, but I think I've got most of it. So mm-hmm. I'm going to go over the parts that I thought were so incisive, and I'm not even going to finish. You know, I'm going to stop like at the halfway mark and say, read Good. the rest for yourself. So um, there is a version online. It's probably not legal, like an authorized to have it up there but it's on the up there i'll link to it uh if you'd like to read a copy um to to own it uh order a copy of we have only this life to live the selected essays of jean paul sartre's 1939 to 1975 nyrb classics ronald aronson adrian vanderhoven editors i'll include a link to that i always like to order from independent bookstores so i i order books from nicholas books which is on my way to work Mm-hmm. And um, 
get them a few days later and I'm going through an independent bookstore. It's nice that way. Yeah. Okay. So the, the very important perspective on elections. We should keep this perspective, I think, in mind when we start arguing with each other about our conventional political topics, and in particular these three like pairs of topics. Mm-hmm. Are you voting? Hmm. Are you voting? You should vote. Hmm. That's one pair. All right. Who are you voting for? Here's who you should vote, vote for it. or must vote for. What party are you supporting? Here's the party you, you should, should support, support or must support. So, timeless piece of radical criticism, keeping in mind that the word radical means root. Means root. Uh, getting at the root of it, Sartre is asking us to think about the origin and effectiveness of voting in a democratic system. Now, in my reading of this essay, he's not literally telling you not to vote, and he's not telling you that you're a fool if you do vote. Right. No, and, uh, no, I'm not saying that. Right. I don't believe that that was actually his point. No. Um, but he is telling people that voting can become a trap in the sense that putting too much faith in voting as literally the least and also the most that we can do to participate in public life is a trap. And yeah. that way of thinking about politics that seeds most of our actual political power can become a trap for us. That's right. what he's getting at. Right. Again, it's a rhetorical <clears throat> trap, and it's inside your brain. Yes, yeah. Traps inside it's, your it's brain. The, it's about the framing. It's kind of a, a George Lakoff, don't think of an elephant way. That if I always you think use, of a duck. <laughs> and I, I, that happened to me now because I read that book. <laughs> you always think of a duck. duck. Don't think of a duck. Quack, quack. Mm, ducks. French oh, fries. French duck fries. Fries. Uh, okay. okay. Carry on. Sorry. So the essay starts. In 1789, the vote was given to landowners. What this meant was that the vote had been given not to men, but to their real estate, to bourgeois property, which could only vote for itself. Although the system was profoundly unfair, since it excluded the greater part of the French population, it was not absurd. Right, and to understand what he means by that, you've got to get a little bit into absurdism and his his philosophy and all that. Right, right. Uh, but th- that's a very provocative statement. Um, mm-hmm. So my commentary: we should keep in mind that in America, the vote was originally also available only to white only, landowners. Only white landowners. When Sartre says that this means the vote was given not to men but to their real estate, he's really pointing out the inherent contradiction of democracy here and suggesting that by associating the vote with the property, you may as well have given the power to the property property itself, itself, not the person. Right. Sartre makes the point that since the property is owned by individuals and not collectively, the system has effectively separated them as they will vote for their individual and not collective interests in defending their property. Precisely. So the essay continues, the voters, of course, voted individually and in secret. This was in order to separate them from one another and allow only incidental connections between their votes. Mm -hmm. But all the voters were property owners and thus already isolated by their land, which closed around them and with its physical impenetrability kept out everything, including people. Mm -hmm. The ballots were discrete quantities that reflected only the separation of the voters. It was hoped that when the votes are counted, were counted, they would reveal the common interest of the greatest number, that is, their class interest. Right. right. So you've basically taken your ballot issues, mm-hmm. given it to these landed voters, mm-hmm. and, and, and the point of the system the whole point. was to give political power to a class right? Uh, with the assumption that they had a consistent and, and similar consistent set of interests interest, right. based around their property. Mm-hmm. So the vote, uh, the system was intentionally set up, that system, so that voters would naturally vote in solidarity with other voters in their class while giving them no reason to vote in solidarity with people in other classes. Outside the class, right. Who won't, they couldn't vote anyway. Right. So that might seem really obvious, but to me, you know, sometimes really obvious things are hiding in plain sight and they should be pointed out. And now here's a, here's a thing that I think this implies that yeah. I'm not sure, I don't think Sartre spells this out. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that means the vote is a rubber stamp. Yes, yes, yeah. 
Right. And, and you're the, gonna, this is what we were going to do. Right. This is what we're going to do. And now it has the imprimatur of being democratic. Exactly. It's yeah, just yeah. to understand. And um, again, like it's often, I think, the work of someone who's a, literally a genius right. to point out the obvious. Right. You know, because it takes a lot of intelligence to peel the onion of everything that is a given it's in a given. our society. But you're looking at it all the time and you never see it. And peel it down and say, here's the, the root. Right. Uh, and so this blew me away. Mm-hmm. Uh, he then goes on to talk about the Le Chapelier Law. And mm-hmm. I'd be lying if I said I understood much about this. I don't think it's that important to understanding the essay. But it sounds like it's a law, was a law, to discourage union organizing. Right. Uh, he writes that it, and I'm quoting again, prohibits any association of workers against their employers. Thus, passive citizens without property who had no access to indirect democracy. Right. And in other words, to the vote that the rich were using to elect their government. Mm -hmm. um, That's what he means by indirect. Were also denied permission. Hang on, I have to just flip pages. To form groups and exercise popular or direct democracy. Right. This could have been the only form of democracy. This would have been the only form of democracy appropriate to them since they could not be separated from one another by their property. Right. So note here that Sartre's reading uh, popular or direct democracy involves organizing and solidarity and is not about voting, which is indirect form yeah. of democracy, representative, right? right? That's the indirection. Mm-hmm. So continuing... Um, Four years later, when the convention replaced the landowner's vote by universal suffrage, <laughs> it still did not choose to repeal the Le Chapelier, Le Chapelier oh, Law. Yeah. You still can't organize unions. Yeah, Consequently, yeah. the workers, deprived once and for all of direct democracy, had to vote as landowners. Pretend they were landowners. Even though they owned nothing. They owned nothing. Popular rallies, which took place often, even though they were prohibited, became illegal even as they remained legitimate. Right. And he's making another radical distinction here between legitimate legitimate exercise of power and democracy by the people and legal exercise of power and democracy. Right. So not to make it sound too silly, but I'm reminded of a line from Money Python and the Holy Grail, right? Strange women lying in ponds distributing swords is no basis for a system of government. government. Supreme executive power derives from a mandate from the masses, not from some farcical aquatic ceremony. (laughs) All right. Yes, yes. Uh, Oh, but this is is an interesting thing, though. Yeah. So, these people have no property, and yet they've got the vote, which only makes sense if you have property. property. So now, basically to vote or to form an opinion to vote with, you have to pretend that you have property or maybe one day will it's or one day will you're a temporarily embarrassed millionaire that's the origin of that yep perspective yep, yep. that oh i'm a temporarily embarrassed so if, if i one day have access to property then i still need to vote based on that future me who and whose whose interests i need to defend right not, rather than my actual neighbors and i'm not allowed to organize with those people like, anyway. anyway or even your actual self your actual even self your actual self who you actually yeah. are you at what you're yeah. actually experiencing so he goes deep into that a little a right. little later but yeah that that and I'll, I'll quote from that i'm gonna read some longish quotes here and i'm sorry if it's running long but uh here we are uh, here we are uh, long quote what voting actually is and does when we go to vote tomorrow, remember this was 1973, we will once again be substituting legal power for legitimate power. The first, which seems precise and perfectly clear-cut, has the effect of separating the voters in the name of universal suffrage. <laughs> this is like I keep throwing the book down. with like, holy crap. The second is still embryonic, diffuse, unclear even to itself. At this point, it is indistinguishable from the vast libertarian and anti-hierarchical movement, which one encounters everywhere, but which is not at all organized yet. All the voters belong to very different groups, but to the ballot box, they are not members of different groups, but citizens. The polling booth standing in the lobby of a school or town hall is the symbol of all the acts of betrayal that the individual may commit against the group he belongs to. To each person, it says, no one can see you. 
You have only yourself to look to. You are going to be completely isolated when you make your decision, and afterwards you can hide that decision or lie about it. Yeah. Nothing more is needed to transform all the voters who enter that hall into potential traitors to one another. Not one thing. Distrust increases the distance that separates them. If we want to fight against atomization, we must try to understand it first. Precisely. Oh, and actually this is what I'm getting at. Whenever, yes. whenever I talk about voting, then this is the point I make when I say I care about my soul. But yes. This is the point I'm making when I say I'm there to do the right thing. What I'm trying to say is, no matter what anybody tells me... You're not there to screw your neighbor. I'm not going to betray you. Yes. I'm, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. I'm not going to go in the booth and betray you. I'm not going to s- sell you out to the prison industrial complex or I the military industrial I won't complex do it. or all these other things. That's, that's what gonna I'm saying. You're going to do your best not to. I'm going to do my best not to. Everything I can to not have that happen to you. So that's what's happening for me. That's what I mean yeah. by doing the right thing. Yeah. So you know, do your best. Men are not born in isolation. They are born into a family which forms them during their first years. Afterwards, they will belong to different socio-professional communities and will start a family themselves. They are atomized when large social forces, work conditions under the capitalist regime, private property, institutions, and so forth, bring pressure to bear upon the groups they belong to, breaking them up and reducing them to the units which supposedly compose them. He talks uh, some like about the army as an example of an institution that requires its members to be, quote, atomized, unquote. Yeah. And you hear that about um, the military, that they break you down in order re- to remake to you. you as a soldier. And you'll notice they're actually the only straight up communism in the country is the military. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, just yeah, he also there. starts using the word serialized, and this is a little bit confusing. Serial or serialized, it's maybe a difficulty in translation. But what he means is that he's forcing, when you're serialized, you're forced to be treated and handled as one at a time. Oh, right. Like in order. All right, you, as an individual, let's take you. You know, you take on the state. Okay, next. Now you You take take on on the the state. state. Look, you're all failing. As opposed to parallelized, where they can act and make demands in groups. Act and parallel as a group. So it's a little paradoxical here. It's critical and true. Some institutions, which are supposedly groups of people, exist effectively to reduce their power. Yeah. And Sartre would contend that all institutions do that. Yeah. And that's a more, I think that's actually a slightly more radical analysis that I'm comfortable with because I do believe institutions can exist that, that work for us and that do good things for us. But you're like, no one can see you waving your arms and yeah, shrugging. Yeah, I just, yeah, I, you know, I don't want to derail you here. Yeah. Like, but I, I, but I don't know. that's his radical analysis, and I'm scratching my head and thinking hard oh, about it. Yeah, yeah. So um, he gives this great example. So this and this was brilliant. There was actually a recent essay mm. by a guy talking, a libertarian, talking about how glorious it was to be able to drive your personal car. Mm. Did I read some of that to you? No, I think I may have read it. Was that Counterpunch? Uh, I don't remember. Maybe uh, Counterpunch or Reason? I think I can't quite remember, but I think I read it. It was anyway. About this guy, like, ranting about how awful it would be to have a state which could take away your ability to to get in your own personal car and go drive wherever you wanted as fast as you can, you want. You know what's better? <laughs> state could take your personal power to walk across a field. <laughs> That's what's much better. Uh, and I want that state. Sartre no, I'm kidding. I don't gives want that this state. great example. So that state. In 1973, he was so prescient that he was already, like, uh, channeling he was dis- he was taking apart this argument before it happened that existed in 2017 for example as soon as a man takes the steering wheel of his car he becomes no more than one driver among others because of this and because of this helps reduce his own speed and everyone else's too oh. which is just the opposite of what he wanted since he wanted to possess his own car right he wanted to be able to go as fast as he wanted wherever he wanted but because it's his own car, and everyone has their own car, participating in this, he's made it worse for everyone. everyone. No one can get across town quickly. You're stuck in traffic. traffic. You're polluting. You're doing, doing all you know. these things, which aren't just driving around in your car. <clears throat> exactly. This isn't really about the car, but it's about how seeking political power as an individual, participating in a particular kind of collective institution, actually serves to reduce the power of all the people. Right. That's the trap. Right. Well, no, it's, it's, it's this thing we have where we want to change 
um, like you know, like the single strike sentencing. Oh, crime is bad, and we don't want these offenders out there, and therefore we're going to have the, the structured sentencing required and sentencing mandatory sentencing and minimums, right? Yeah, yeah. And now the fact of the matter is. Any one of us may have to encounter the justice system Mm -hmm. and then be subject to those mandatory minimums. Yes. Yeah. But we don't We don't think it's going to be us. We don't think it's going to be us. We don't believe that about the system. It doesn't really apply to us. What we think is that if we're in that situation, we will have these resources to deal with the system. This protection. We're going to be facing the system as individuals and they'll consider us as individuals and that'll be good. Right. No, Not it's, exactly, really. the it's exactly the opposite. It's designed to extract money and power and chew you up and, and spit you out. and make a profit off your misery for as long as possible. As long as possible. And but we convince ourselves that that's not what's really happening. That actually we're taking action to make our community safer. Yeah. yeah. Is that, is, that's right. not what's happening at all. Right. And that that's the kind of radical analysis he's doing about right. about voting here. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I don't read this as Sarth really telling Americans in twenty seventeen that they shouldn't vote. Um, that would be a very literal context-free interpretation of the essay, but he's asking us to think about what effective exercise of political power could really look like. What do you mean? What it could be? And I'm continuing now. Let us take the case of a business where there has not been a strike for 20 or 30 years, but where the buying power of the worker is constantly falling because of the high cost of living. Each worker begins to think about a protest movement, but 20 years of social peace have gradually established serial relations among the workers. That is, they deal with each other only as one at a time as one individuals. Time. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, any strike, even if it were only for 24 hours, would require a regrouping of those people. At that point, serial thinking, which separates them, vigorously resists the first sign of group thinking. Serial thinking will take several forms. It will be racist. Quote, the immigrant workers would not go along with us. Yeah. Sexist, quote, the women would not understand us. Yeah. Hostile to other categories of society. Quote, the small shopkeepers would not help us any yeah. more than the country people would. No, they wouldn't. Why would they? Distrustful, quote, the man near me is other, so I don't know how he would react. Yeah, he might do anything. And so forth. All the separatist arguments represent not the thinking of the workers themselves, but the thinking of the others whom they have become and whom want to keep their identity and their distance. If the regrouping should come about successfully, there will be no trace left of this pessimistic ideology. Its only function was to justify the maintenance of serial order and of an impotence that was in part tolerated and in part accepted. Mm -hmm. So again, I don't think Sartre was actually in 1973 denouncing identity politics per se. Not per se. It is a very communist vision, Mm -hmm. and this is slightly problematic when you read Sartre because he was a pretty hardcore communist by the end of his life, Mm -hmm. and you have to wrestle with that yourself. Um, He was, in a prescient way, denouncing the cynical use to which identitarian thinking could be put. Yes. Right. In my view, no political group has abused identitarian thinking quite as badly as so-called liberals and centrists in the 2016 election. <laughs> no, that's, it was profane. <laughs> and it yeah. still is. Yeah. Uh, Sartre then moves on to the topic of how parties work. I'm tempted to read the whole thing. I'm going to refrain from that. Uh, I really think you should read this essay. <laughs> try to, yeah, you really should. And try this to, is a great essay. So I only have a little, little more to go, but basically that's, if I can summarize everything I'm trying to say about it, is, hey, you should read this, this essay. essay. Um, and try to understand his radical argument for yourself. There's a lot in it. He takes on the ideas of parties, the ideas of proportional representation, coalitions, and even ideas behind things like gerrymandering, Mm -hmm. right? Structural impediments to to power. I don't think he's making really making an argument we shouldn't vote. He's making an argument in favor of what he calls direct democracy, solidarity, collective action, not mediated through existing institutions. Right. Uh, I don't know to what extent he's literally denouncing the concept of all institutions per se, but in this essay, he's asking us to think bigger by thinking smaller Mm -hmm. about individual freedom and action, a much more radical idea of solidarity with our neighbors unmediated by institutions. It's really, I'm calling it bracing. It's like a dash of cold water on your brain. 
Woo. A couple more brief quotes. Yeah. The voter must remain lying down, steeped in his own powerlessness. He will thus choose parties so that they can exert their authority and not his. Each man locked in his right to vote just as landowner, as the landowner is locked inside his land, will choose his masters for the next four years without seeing that this so-called right to vote is simply the refusal to allow him to unite with others in resolving the true problems by praxis. That is by action. By action. What you do. Another quote. When I vote, I abdicate my power. That is the possibility everyone has of joining others to form a sovereign group which would have no need of representatives. By voting, I confirm the fact that we, the voters, are always other than ourselves. You were, you mentioned this earlier. You saw right into that, that mm-hmm. he's literally talking about our alienation from our true selves. Our true selves, right. Yeah. Other than ourselves, none of us can ever desert the seriality in favor of the group except through intermediaries. Mm-hmm. This is kind of what I was getting at talking about parties, and I was saying, like making a halfway joke that I wouldn't want to be, uh, become a member of a party that would have, have me. me. <laughs> like Grouch's old joke. Old saw. Um, for the serialized citizen, to vote is undoubtedly to give his support to a party, but is even more to vote for voting. Yeah. And that's, I to think, a pretty profound thing. Yeah. As Kravitz says, uh, I don't know who Kravitz is, that is to vote for the political institution that keeps us in a state of political serialization. And, you know, and anarchists <clears throat> will say, well, I'm not voting for this reason because I don't want to reaffirm the power structure. Um, and I, I affirm that as completely legitimate, personally. But um, people are like, what does that even mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, you give voting legitimacy when you vote. Reading Sartre is hard. Oh, yeah, it's hard, but and, it's worth and it. I, conf- I think it's worth it. It's worth it, but confronting these ideas is hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, it really requires you to be willing to peel the onion. Right. And think hard about your assumptions. Right, and, and I think it's so simple, it, it's like, it seems ridiculous. It's to me, to me, reading this essay was a little bit like when I first read a cogent explanation of how fractional reserve banking actually works how money is loaned into existence. And you were like, what? This scheme is so uh, weird and counterintuitive that it's been described as it actually repels the mind. Like your right. mind bounces off of it. You can't believe that's what no. it is. Yeah. And you yeah, read it and study it, it three, four, five times, and finally yeah. you're like, oh my God, that's, that's, what it, that's really what literally it is. what it is. Money is just loaned out. This, art, non-existent. this non-existent entity that's loaned into existence, and that's what money now is what it is how, that's all it is <laughs> so but and I think people never are, this is a digression I'm sorry but people never like pick up on the return to do that yes if it's only liberal loaned into his existence there's never enough money to pay it back there's never enough money to pay it back that's part that's of the thing that's baked it's always, into the system it's the value of your money over time is always declining right and so I talked about that uh, on a podcast conversation years ago years ago so I don't but, want to quite um, yeah, dive down that rabbit yeah. hole but Similarly, when you say, well, I don't want to vote because that just affirms that voting matters. Right. And people are like, huh? Well, <laughs> if I vote, I'm saying it matters. Yeah. And I don't think it does so. Or I don't think that structure, this, this infrastructure, this intellectual infrastructure is valid. I'm not going to valid. It's like when people say, I'm not going to dignify that with a response. Right. right. That's what not voting is for a lot of people yeah. who choose not to vote. Yeah. Well, saying, <laughs> we did vote, and I do. I am. Planning, I vote every time. I'm planning to continue voting. I'm planning to continue. And so what I, I, I missed ga- you. Yeah, two votes in like the okay. last what twenty six, twenty seven yes. years. But I mean, like I said, what I gained from this essay is not, hey, you shouldn't vote. It's mm-hmm. that you should really do analysis, you know, do a radical analysis of what voting gets you and what it gains you, and what you could be doing in addition to voting, in addition to, instead of yeah, you know, instead what, you of know. for some people, yeah, but depending on your your practice. Okay couple more quotes almost done why am i going to vote because i've been persuaded that the only political act in my life consists of depositing my ballot in the box once every four years but that is the very opposite of an act yeah i'm only revealing my powerlessness and obeying the power of a party Uh, skipping ahead a little bit. Actually, everything is quite clear if one thinks it over and reaches the conclusion that direct democracy is a hoax, or indirect democracy is a hoax. Hmm. Ostensibly, the elected assembly is the one which reflects public opinion most faithfully. 
But there is only one sort of public opinion, and it is serial. The imbecility of the mass media, the government pronouncements, the biased or incomplete reporting in the newspapers, fake news, all this comes to seek us out in our serial solitude and load us down with wooden ideas formed out of what we think others will think. Yes. <clears throat> the individual voter saying, I'm voting strategically. Yeah. You've got a strategy? <laughs> Wow, tell me more. <laughs> Deep within us, there are undoubtedly demands and protests, but because they're not echoed by others, they wither away. Yeah. And that's allegedly the process of maturing, mm. right, into, yeah. a, into, that's real politic. Yeah. Right, developing an approach that is real politic and yeah. not idealism. You're a grown up. Right. Because you're a grown up. Uh, they wither away and leave us with a, quote, bruised spirit, unquote, and a feeling of frustration. Yeah. So when we are called to vote, I, the other, have my head stuffed with petrified ideas which the press or television has piled up there. They are serial ideas which are expressed through my vote, but they are not my ideas. The institutions of bourgeois democracy have split me apart. There is me, and there are all the others, they tell me I'm a, I am. There are all the others they tell me I am a Frenchman, a soldier, a worker, a taxpayer, your identities, right? A, t right. a citizen, and so on. Mm -hmm. This splitting up forces us to live with what psychiatrists call a perpetual identity crisis. <laughs> <laughs> Who am I in the end? An other, identical with all the others, inhabited by these impotent thoughts which come into being everywhere and are not actually thoughts anymore. Mm hmm. Or am I myself, and who is voting? I don't recognize myself anymore. <laughs> and that was, that was part of it. I did not, had I voted for Clinton, I would not have recognized in myself the person who was voting for m more war, for more financialization, for more prison industrial complex, for, like, more, this person? for more financial services industry, for more campaign contract finance. I know that man. I, I don't. This? I don't know that person. Right. It's not me. Yeah. yeah. That was that was that was my crisis yeah. when I left the Republican Party. Like, yeah. What the hell? Who, you weren't. It wasn't this you. Isn't, this is me. Last quote. Yeah. If they want to return to direct democracy, the democracy of people fighting against the system, of individual men fighting against the seriality which transforms them into things, why not start here? To vote or not to vote is all the same. I'm not going to quite agree with that, but to abstain is in effect to confirm the new majority, whatever it may be. Whatever we may do about it, we will have done nothing if we do not fight at the same time. And that means starting today against the system of indirect democracy, which deliberately reduces us to powerlessness. Mm -hmm. So you can, if you're, if you're just voting, you're doing nothing if you're not also fighting to undermine the need to vote. The need to vote. Right, right. We must try, each according to his own resources, to organize the vast anti-hierarchic movement which fights institutions everywhere. Mm -hmm. Anyway. I, I think... Um, so this, this is the idea that, you know, voting or not voting doesn't matter. And I, I actually agree with Sartre in that. That I, you, it, I think you respect a, some people's choices not to vote. I, I respect anyone's choice to not vote. Yeah. Yeah. That um, even uh, even if it's a valid choice for them, I it's not the choice I'm ready to make for myself. You, you're not. I'm not prepared to make that choice. I I, I don't. Yeah. I, I feel like it. Would, again, it would be a betrayal of myself and my ancestors to do so. Yeah. And I'm not prepared to do that. I I'm not willing to do that. I hope that I'm the kind of person that would never sign a false confession. You right. Know, you know what I mean. Right. I, I hope there I never. Are th there are three lights. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. I'm not gonna. No, there are four lights. I see four lights. I yeah. see four lights. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I hope that I'm that person in in all, in all contexts. But um, and I am going to say and endorse and affirm that they're equivalent. Just because uh, people people who choose not to conform in any way are exercising agency, and when you exercise agency. You're doing something, yes, which is more yeah. than nothing. It's more than nothing. It's more than nothing. Now, a friend of mine, an anarchist friend of mine, you know, this this vegan freak. Her husband was imprisoned for 
political reasons and yeah. is just suffering through everything. Yeah. She's just suffering. She doesn't vote. Yeah. But she's suffering through everything. And every day, every day, she gets online and she says, Someone out there, what do you need? How can I help? Yes. She's yeah. suffering no, through I everything. Know who you're talking about. Yeah. And so, you know, um, I don't think she has to vote. <laughs> She's no, doing it. She's that's making the it thing. Happen. If you if yeah, you're if you're making it happen, yeah, she doesn't need to If vote. you're doing <laughs> political acts, if you're committing even as dumb a political act as this one, yeah, this is kind right, of stupid. But here we are. We're right, doing it. We're trying to make it happen. So. Then judge us less by who we, you know, please judge us less by who we voted or didn't vote for. Then our the ideas and the ripples we're trying to spread out into the world. Out into the world, right? Which you know, and our acts, a lot of which we don't even talk about and aren't overtly uh, political, but right, they represent who we are. Who we are in our seriality, right? And so, and I, and I don't make any judgment about people who voted and did, and maybe did vote for <clears throat> candidates that I I couldn't bring myself to support. Yeah. Um. I hope and assume the best. Yes. But all people, at least I try to. It's hard. I have a hard time with that. Uh, so do I. I, I, I run into trouble. You know, like with one it. of one of my Facebook friends said, oh, "I support Roy Moore." I'm like, I have a really hard time convincing myself. Oh, deep down, he's really a good person. You know, I. It's it's hard for me. Or there's any solidarity there to it, be had with with me? You know, it, it's hard for me. Yeah. But I aspire <laughs> to, to to be that to be that person who, who yeah. sees the best. Yeah. Um. So I just wanted to affirm that yes, I think it's I yes. really think it's okay, and it's really roughly equal. I'm not going to judge right. anyone for not voting, and I'm yeah, not going to judge people for, about who they voted for. When people start chewing me out for my vote, I'm like, wow, you you're really giving me a lot of power oh. that I don't feel I have. Yeah. You know, are you sure that's that's appropriate? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, at least you've given me the power apparently to make you miserable. <laughs> Thanks. And that's more than I had to more influence ever- the election. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I wasn't really interested in that, actually. <laughs> right. All right. So yeah. Okay. So that's 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 essay. That's essay. Uh, yeah. Well, there's a lot to. Lot to it's chew it's an amazing essay, and I'm reading more essays from this from this mm-hmm. book of essays, that's including one on Faulkner that I'm going to work into a thing oh, anyway. Mm-hmm. It's but that's you get into a froth. I'm getting into a froth. So yeah. let's um let's move on because we do have a third topic. Oh, that's right. We have a whole third topic. <laughs> uh, but you know what? I don't think this is actually that long. Okay. I I think this is fairly to the point. Topic number three. Have we started already? Have we started already? You've been going for a long time. No, it's self-care during the holidays. Self-care during the holidays. So we want to wish everyone a happy holiday. Right now it's Hanukkah. Yes. We just got off the feast of St. Lucy. We're not opposed to saying Merry Christmas. Oh. We can say Merry Christmas. But it's not Christmas yet. We can walk and chew gum. You know, I'm an Advent... Um, You're an Grinch. Adventist. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm an Advent Grinch, right? Yes. So it's not Christmas yet. Yes, yes. You only and you it's know I don't even think you should Advent. really have your trees up at, during Advent. That was my compromise. Uh, that was my compromise. Well, willing to put the tree up starting on the first day of Advent. First day of Advent, I'll not put the tree up. Not before that. Oh, for God's sake, no. Costco had their trees up, at least August? some of them, and they were starting to. Uh, uh, they're starting to stock Christmas things. It was a few days before my birthday, September 26th. Okay, so, September. so it was September. But still. It was only just past, I think, mid-September. That's offensive. I'm sorry. It's like, really? We offensive. can't even have... Labor Day finish? We yeah. can't even have Halloween. <laughs> we can't have Thanksgiving. Maybe. None of those things are just, just going to steamroll right uh, into, right on to, straight on to Black Friday. There we go. Jesus. Bring it. So, yeah, no, no, I'm... I really enforce, try to enforce second sale to the right <laughs> and straight on till morning. <laughs> a period of anticipation. Yes. And I will tell you all Merry Christmas when it's freaking Christmas. When it's Christmas. <laughs> all right. Meanwhile, we're actually in the middle of Hanukkah. We're in the middle of Hanukkah. Eight wonderful days. We're when we we we're doing. We're not, um, you know, Orthodox any anything. We're not uh, really. I'm a little Orthodox Catholic, but yeah. That's okay, about it. but we're not pr- really practicing Jews. Any of us? No, I just am a Jew. I'm not a practicing you Jew. Are. <laughs> and but we have been celebrating Hanukkah as, yeah. in a way as we do. Day five. Day five, and today we uh, so we've been eating lots of fatty food. 
Lots of fried food. Best way to celebrate. (laughs) We'll probably make latkes tomorrow night for dinner. Uh, Tonight we assembled a gingerbread house. A Hanukkah house. A Hanukkah gingerbread house. It had like uh, Stars of David and Blue White Frosting. So we actually bought two. We bought a Christmas Christmas themed gingerbread house and a Hanukkah themed gingerbread house. They just came with different colors, icing, decoration, and pictures on the box. That's (laughs) the only differences. Mostly, for my part, I, I try to. My goal is to share with the children um, a little bit, a little bit of their ancestral about knowledge, their tradition. So a little bit about tradition. And so ancestral they're knowledge. listening to the Maccabees until it drives me batty, <laughs> <laughs> and asking questions and talking and asking about questions them. and trying yeah. to understand a little bit about the, the Jewish tradition. The Jewish tradition, yes. and and I should be clear, Hanukkah is actually a minor Jewish holiday. Yeah, I, I think yeah, it takes on outsized yeah, meaning right, in the right. Christian culture. Sure, because it happens Goes close along to with Christmas when the, Christmas yeah. happens. No, it's, but it's not, actually it's a minor not a, holiday. It's not the high holidays. It's not the high holidays. Right. It's not Passover. Right. It's actually not a big deal. Yeah. No, a Passover lot of Jews, is the biggest. Ba- no, Passover is a big deal, and the high holidays, the highest yeah. holidays, are Rosh Hashanah and Rosh Hashanah. Yeah, yeah, which happened in the fall around the Jewish New Year. Right. But no, the um, but Hanukkah is a lot of families. Like they light candles, right? And they don't even give gifts. Yeah, they, they don't even decorate. Like it's it's a thing. It's for most families. It's like the way we might celebrate the feast of Saint Lucy, or like the Assumption, mm-hmm. or some other feast day. A fe- uh, one like of a, the many. One of the many minor yeah. feast days. Yeah. There there are lots of minor Jewish holidays, like Rosh Hashanah, yeah. not not Rosh Hashanah, uh, like um, like Hanukkah, like Tu B'Shvat. Or which is festival of trees even, or sukkah. You know, or, I don't even know what all these are. Yeah, like, so if you if you watch a whole bunch of the videos by the Maccabees, you'll start to, you'll pick, start up to pick up some of what they. So are. there are lots of things, yeah. and lots of ways you could do it. Um, uh, the, the sukkah is remind you of Halloween. Uh-huh. That people dress up in costumes uh-huh. and so on. Um, but the um, the point is to seize any opportunity we can to educate the children yes. by the Jewish interests. Yeah. So, uh, this is one and of And to make bad jokes. Uh, and to make bad jokes. <laughs> and, and to eat well. Right. Yeah, that's really... But you're, you're talking about lighting candles, and I think you're, you're, you're getting at something, because to me, the approach to the solstice, you know, is the... Mm-hmm. Uh, everyone's like, oh, it's the most wonderful, the ma- most magical time, all that bullshit. To me, this is the worst time of the year. Mm-hmm. I s- suffer from um, seasonal that. affective disorder. Mm-hmm. My... Depression and anxiety, which exists always, mm-hmm. it's um, around actually, uh, waxes and wanes. But in towards this time of year, it gets debilitating. Mm-hmm. And to me, what the holidays mean are trying to bring some of the light back that doesn't exist outside. Yeah, and trying to do some things with family and small groups of people to socialize and share comforting food and all that mm-hmm. to try to compensate a little bit for the fact that I'm during this time of year, I'm having panic attacks constantly. I'm thinking about self harm constantly. I'm, I'm spacey. I can barely function even mm-hmm. just so like a little thing. We went to this uh, concert last night. Yeah. J- Joshua had a choir concert and I had to drive from work and get there across town to a place in downtown Ann Arbor, which I haven't been to in a long time. And, More than 10 years, probably. Yeah. And the prospect of doing this, like just driving downtown, parking in a parking structure, going to the church and meeting you there and arranging the tickets and all that, getting there on time and all that, was enough to make me panicked all day. Mm-hmm. And when I got there, I was pretty worked up. Mm-hmm. It was a nice concert. It was. But then there was like a reception in the basement, and the crush of people going into the stairwell in the basement was so intense that I had a near panic attack. I had to go hang out in the hallway for 15 minutes or so while the the number of people died down because I can't be, this time of year, I can't be in a crowd of people. I just Not can't. Like no, it's very... Yeah. It's, it's, it's dramatic for you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and I can't, like, explain this to you know, everyone. To everyone you meet. <laughs> everyone I meet. It's like... By the way, but um, it's true. It's real, and it yeah. happens to me. And getting now, and the funny thing about this is, I'm actually better uh, the last few years and this year than I have yeah. been in previous years. Yeah, you're, you're pretty good. This year. I have not had a tearful, screaming meltdown like you know yet this year. Um, no. <clears throat> I can actually only remember one in like the last five years. 
Yeah, but it's this is <clears throat> this is the worst time of year, and to me, these holiday things, these mm-hmm. social gatherings, all of these things, they work well for me if they're very low key. Mm-hmm. If there's fires, if there's candles, if there's a lot of light, if there's yeah. conversation and supportive people, but not if they're like, not if they're tuned and arranged for extroverts as extrovert parties oh yeah if they're like that i'm you're out of, miserable. Out of, the, out of the running yeah yeah no i'm i'm the i would do three three holiday parties in a day if i could yeah. <laughs> the extrovert things yeah so, so but that i i think what that translates to i think yeah. is that you have to be willing to say no to some things yes and to say you know that's not going to work for me it's not going to work for our family and i'm yeah yeah no and i i want to do yeah, that I, yeah. and, and try to do that and especially because there's so many things going on I'm wanting to stay home yeah, just stay home and just you know and I, by the fire and enjoy and I rarely get well, you know with six kids it's hard too because they're always pushing my buttons but I rarely get a whole day to actually do the things that are comforting you right know? right the things that are really soothing and and there's a lot of traditional things that are soothing and comforting because this isn't like a this isn't mythical or a mystery no humans have had a hard time making it through the darkest part of the year for eons yes and we have these traditions to soothe and comfort ourselves and to carry us through and to check in on each other and to support each other their um the particular name or occasion that's assigned to these things yeah has changed yeah the dates have changed. Yeah, they just, they shift. All they those, these things yeah. shift. But this is why these things persist in this time of year. Right. And if you're not, say, a, a believer in uh, Christianity or Judaism or whatnot, take what you can get from this season as basically a ritual that's trying to support you with the comfort of light and warmth and community the degree of socializing up to whatever you are capable of tolerating right take well, I, from that what consolation and support you can get you can get and that's like actually i think the reason i use the word community rather than socialization because uh-huh. socialization is not necessarily community okay and community is not necessarily socialization okay so, I mean, yeah, you, you, you mean, people. To me, it, it's not very helpful to go meet a bunch of random strangers. Yeah, you know? which is socializing. Yes, but community of people you know and people that know you and support you that actually are are going to be there for you and maybe that even will have a sympathetic ear if you tell them how you really feel. Hi, hey, so how you doing? I almost never can tell anyone I work with or casual friends or people I know. How you doing, Paul? You don't know. Don't just don't ask. Just, don't, don't, don't ask. ask. You don't. You don't want. You don't you'll leave you. crying. Yeah, you don't want to know. <laughs> I don't want to do that to you. So just right. like that's right. Let's not go there. Yeah. Let's yeah. Just, let's just stick to the small talk. Oh, I tried. I made notes. You made um, notes. I did make notes. I'm sorry. Um, I started on a rant and then. Oh, d- d- once again okay. trying to do real. Oh, but we, we we covered a lot of what the notes were. Okay. Largely that these traditions have. You see all these soppy. Um, holiday uh, hallmark specials and they're like yeah. what's the true meaning of christmas <laughs> what's the true meaning of capitalism <laughs> what's the true meaning of hanukkah what's the true meaning of kwanzaa <laughs> you know and well, let's go to the let's go to the christmas.com website to find to out to find out now the meaning is and we we just reviewed the meaning the meaning is to be there for each other through the darkest times mm-hmm. that's the meaning you know yes. and that there's light mm-hmm. there's light coming even in these dark times whether the light is literally the birth of the messiah or the sun or the sun <laughs> <laughs> or the fact that the days are finally getting, getting longer, longer. Again. but that, that that's we're almost real there. we're almost there that that's real <laughs> and that's true and we can be together through the darkest We're times. We're almost there. We're almost to the darkest day. So, and this year, people are really feeling it because these are grim times. These are grim times. Yeah. But it, but we can still be there for each other. We can we can make it. We can make it. So. Oh, and that's and that's the meaning, you know. Yeah. So I think if you are able to stay focused on the meaning and celebrate whatever's truly there to celebrate for you. I mean, I think we made yeah. a decision. What was it? Like year one or two in our marriage, we decided that we weren't going to do a lot of traveling for Christmas. We weren't going to make right. it this thing. Uh, like it's, this. it's 
Yeah, let's let's take the the most anxiety filled and depressed part of the year and get on a plane and <laughs> combine it with the busiest travel day of the year. Mm. No, 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 no. no. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's and your mileage may vary. There may be things that are comforting and valuable for you. You should do you know those what? things. If 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 I were a singleton, mm-hmm. or it was we were just a couple again, um, and had time off. Yeah. You know, my work, um, it's not that bad, right? Assuming no. you're not stuck in an airport for 36 hours or whatever, but God, in a snowstorm. But, right. But it's it's not so bad. But tra- doing all of these things with small children that are not tolerant of... <laughs> a lot of travel, yeah. Yeah, is no, no, it's it's too much. Yeah, it's not worth it. Do what works. And I think the, my last point on self-care during the holidays, because you know better than anyone else does what to do to take care of yourself. What works for you. Right, but... um. I think this is actually true for everyone. Even my hardcore shopper friends, this Mm -hmm. is true. Mm -hmm. I think we have to reject the commercialized holiday. Absolutely. That has to be rejected full stop. Even if you're a capitalist, uh, you you still must be, honestly, if you've got any sensitivity at all in you, you must be repulsed by what has become. repulsive. What this has become. And it, or or even if if the way in for you, the way to accept it is look at the fate of the people who are shipping all this stuff and making all this stuff and working in the warehouses and building right. all this stuff. I mean, there's there's this there's this way in which uh, sort of shaming people for doing their Black Friday shopping ends up ends up shaming people yeah. who couldn't afford this any other time <clears throat> of the year, right? That's not the point. And that's not the point. That's not where I'm going with this. And there are people who actually enjoy shopping. We aren't even really buying our kids Christmas gifts. Yeah, we, yeah, We're it's not, not part of our thing. Well, no, and it's not has they nothing to like, do with. They get like one or two small gifts. Small gifts, right? It's it's not part of our religious observance. They got oranges and chocolate bars in their shoes for the sure. feast of Saint Nicholas. Right. Um, and they look forward to that now. <laughs> That's so the much. thing. That's what's. It's been amazing, honestly, to see to see our kids come up with these different traditions than, than I grew up with and, right. the, and to some extent you grew up with and mm-hmm. to see them actually taking joy in spending time together, yeah, right. doing things like building this, this Hanukkah gingerbread, house, this right. Hanukkah house right. and, and finding like an orange in your shoe when you get up to actually be over, be like showing joy, joy about that. It's well, not the, an iPhone. It's not an iPhone. <laughs> well, no, what's most telling to me is that they get chocolate and oranges in their shoes, right? Yes. And then they're going to be real sneaky. They're going to be St. Nicholas. And they leave chocolate and oranges they, they in our shoes. They actually chocolate in our shoes. Yes. Yeah. It was really sweet. Yeah, because, you know, they're not... It's called re-gifting. <laughs> re-gifting. Yeah, it was the lame chocolates they didn't want. Right, right? but no, it's that, it was, no, don't say that. Yeah. No, it's not, that's not true, actually. Yeah, they were I'm all teasing. The same. They were all the same chocolates, all the same quality. Uh, but... Um, the the idea it was joyful for them and they wanted to share that sure, sure. and it was really lovely and yes. sweet to see yes yes um and that's you know the kind of celebration that i think has meaning for us yeah. i'm sure there's celebration that has meaning for you they they're wanting to get together and they've been begging us like mm-hmm. maybe tomorrow night right to to fry latkes we want to fry latkes come on because <laughs> it's what they, we do they keep they keep listening to the songs about frying latkes okay, so like, come on it's time to it's fry time to fry like, oh, it's salivating we have to, we have to it's go get grading. a 20 pound bag of potatoes make enough latkes for these yeah, kids yeah. but still you know it's worth it it's worth it yes it'll be great and then and you notice it it's potatoes right potatoes are what how much could a potato possibly cost i don't know what like ten dollars yeah so this is the point where we try to pretend we didn't actually have to stop because we had a technical problem where the recording just Locked stopped. Stop like, recording I th- anything. I think the logic on my little um, Mac Mini hit the two gig file mark and just stopped recording. Like, and it was still it was It was still rolling, but the the file ended. The file ended. Oh yeah, that didn't happen. <laughs> that didn't happen. So we had to back up. Like, we didn't have to back up. Like. Uh, we we didn't minutes. lose about five minutes and do the last bit, but actually listening back, I thought it was pretty good. So I thought we should just try and patch it together and yeah. redo the last, the last five, five minutes, minutes rather than try and redo the whole segment. So no, that's really, not what yeah. we're doing. That didn't happen. <clears throat> anyway, 
You're going to believe <laughs> it. <laughs> your lying ears. <laughs> I'm just glad we didn't lose more than that. So yeah, no, that that was heartbreaking. That we one just time. don't have the time to, yeah, to, go to back redo and everything. No, I I think I had one last note yes. that I wanted to make after all that we've covered. Yep. Um, and this is a, just a little note to my fellow Christians. I don't actually like if you're not, you, you can you can just go get some tea or something for a moment. <laughs> um, I think we need to have a little talk about uh, what's happened to Christmas. Yes. And um. And just admit that we've lost this battle. So, to say a little more about what the the battle is, the, well, like the libido war over Christmas. No, not the, no, no, not this <sighs> bullshit. You know, yeah, you know, Merry Christmas just, versus Happy Holidays. Yeah, no, 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 no. Um, so Christmas is an important Christian holiday. Yes, it is literally Christ's mass. Yes, his his. Mass for his birth, right? And it's it's really, um, you may know that Christ is central to Christianity. Yes, and um, this is a holy time and a holy thing. Mm-hmm. Okay, and um, what we do now as a so- society to celebrate Christmas is unholy, in- including in- what a lot of Christians do, what, including what a lot of Christians do. It's grotesque. And it's perverse, and it has nothing. It is not of Christ, and I think we need to kind of regroup and refocus to something that can be truly Christian again. And I don't. I don't mean skipping Christmas or like not going no. to mass, but rather maybe refocus the energy that we pour into Christmas. Maybe we could pour that into the feast of the Incarnation. Yeah. Maybe we could pour that into Easter. Yes. Maybe and centered that that is as, as like the recenter the spiritual year yeah, around and just kind of one of these and acknowledge that Christmas has become hopelessly commercialized. Really? Not, not, you're not saying you don't celebrate it, but no, no, no. I don't think we need to stop but celebrating. Stop, Christmas. But stop fighting with people over it. But stop fighting with people over it. Just, just <clears throat> let them be. Just let let the seculars have their secular their Christmas. Christmas. They've taken it. They've perverted it. We've gone along with it. It's still, yeah, su- still yeah. alongside them as it's happened. Yeah. I think we need to acknowledge our failures in that. Downshift your, your Christmas. And just kind of you know, step back elsewhere. and focus elsewhere. Yeah. And um, that sort of like spiritual energy that you pour into Christmas, mm-hmm. pour that into the Feast of the Incarnation when Christ actually was conceived. That's what the Feast of the Incarnation is, that he was actually conceived in and the spark of his life came into the world. Yeah, I, let's, the, let's refocus. I keep, I'm still, uh, you know, I've been married to a Catholic woman for what? <laughs> a long time. <laughs> a number of years now. Yeah. Uh, 16 years. And mm-hmm. I'm still uh, hearing little tidbits about traditional Catholic teaching that blow my mind now, every now and then. Yeah, yeah. Because they just don't, are, either they don't exist in my Presbyterian tradition or they're so de-emphasized that I never hear, heard about right, them. Right, right. So, like, apparently there's, there are saints that are recognized as um, Mary's parents. Yeah, I'd never heard of that until today. That was I. I that kind of blew my mind that you didn't know. No, I've never heard of that. I, I couldn't believe that you didn't know. <clears throat> Even Anglicans have, have Anna. And, okay. Yeah, yeah. And as, again, it, it's largely because it comes something that comes out of the oral tradition or the celebratory tradition or the whatnot. It's the capital T tradition of the church, rather than this, rather than from scripture. Yes, because there's no it's, scriptures are silent on that subject. Mm-hmm. So, um, but no, we've got all kinds of things. things like the feast and the feast of the incarnation, as you might guess, is yes. nine months before his birth. Yes, so March twenty fifth, feast of the incarnation, is a wonderful would be a wonderful um, uh, feast day <coughs> for us to embrace with the spiritual zeal that we embrace Christmas with. Hmm. Yeah, um, it's just a thought, you know. I'm open to other suggestions and other perspectives on this, but what's what Christmas has become is profane, and Christians should not participate. I think our friends are doing stuff like this in the you know our friends, the Martins. Oh, very much so. Or doing the to make Catholicism great again, <laughs> or well, make Catholicism weird again. <laughs> it it is that's it is, it is from weird from stuff. the rituals that that they celebrate, which. The, they didn't make up. No, no. The, like the story of, of St. Martin mm-hmm. and, and the little march through the woods we did and all that yeah. and the bonfire. That was fascinating to me. And I, I, I love that they're taking these 
these uh, stories and rites from almost from deep time, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, from the earlier days of the church. I mean, that's from the, the Roman Empire time. Uh, yeah, Middle Ages. Well, isn't the story about a Roman soldier? Oh, um, it's, it is like the, the late, that, that sort of, St. Martin is right at the end of the Roman Empire, the beginning of the Middle Ages. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, there's some blur line there. Right, right. But, but still, it's a long time it's ago, long and time it's not ago. something you, you hear, you know, <laughs> it doesn't... <laughs> it wasn't yesterday's news. It's not a, it's not a big... Um, a big day for Macy's parades. No, no, it's <laughs> and not. Stuff like that. No, no one's drinking. Coca Cola doesn't have no. St. Martin on their, you know, in their ads selling bottles. Um, unless it's the island. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah, no, no, there's no green, green beer being vomited in the alley. <laughs> you know, it's, it doesn't involve any of that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, so we can, we can really profane the faith. There's you really l- can profane it, but you, you don't have to. There's don't lots, have to. And, so there's lots of wonderful Christian traditions to pour your, your energy and, right. and your devotion into that are yes. rewarding to do so. Deeply rewarding. Yeah. Uh, really, and the Advent season is f- rife. I mean, it's one after the other after the other. I mean, there's St. Nicholas, and there's a Lady of Guadalupe, mm-hmm. and there's St. Lucy. Yeah, and we mentioned already how yeah. our kids enjoyed the St. Nicholas Day celebration, which, yeah. by the way, was the genesis of the secular uh, Christmas. Right, right. right. At least allegedly. The secular St. The secular Saint Nick, Saint, uh, yeah, Santa Claus. Santa, Santa, Santa Claus, Santa Claus. Um, at least allegedly. There's a, holiday, there's a few holidays of obligation. In addition to yeah. Christmas itself, there's... Um, um, Feast of the Immaculate Conception. The Immaculate Conception is Mary, not Jesus. Yeah, that also was confusing to me. <laughs> and then, yeah, the there's another Marian holiday on the January first. Yeah. Um, there are lots of things. There's lots of places to put your time and your energy and your love. Feast of Saint Lucy also, uh, if you if you do it upright, it carries a little extra thrilling risk of lighting your hair on fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, take it all the way. It's good stuff. So um, there's there's. A rich tradition to celebrate, and we, we don't need to engage in the commercial holiday at all. No, that's not required no. of you, and we don't do that yeah, a whole don't. lot. No, so, um, so we've got a little list of feedback. Yes, um, my friend V. Jamero, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I think I've never heard your name pronounced. Oops. Um, I'm sure it's in, fun. <laughs> <laughs> writes in that she'd be interested to hear, hear a show on sort of our uh, political biographies, like mm-hmm. you know, like what. What does that mean for you? Where did that come from? Yeah. Um, and we're happy to do it. We're happy to do it. Take we're it always, uh, you know, who who doesn't like talking about themselves? Right? Yeah, I can talk about myself all day. I Actually, I, I do. find I'm it sorry. very boring and frustrating. But yeah, No, I'm, I'm really... I'd rather talk about ideas. But. Yeah. But no, I keep talking about myself. It's terrible. Yeah. No, it's, it's just part of the human frailty. Right. So, but we're going to... Take a break first before we do another show at all about anything. We're going to take a break. We need a break. We're going to take a Christmas break, a brief hiatus. We'll be back January 21? January 21st. Uh, yeah. And the so what I want to work on during the break um, is, you know, putting this show together requires numerous hours of my time to do the technical prep and right. editing and music and uh, and all the stuff related to the upload and producing of the files and audio file video, all that. I do none of that. You do none of that. No. But um, and in addition to the time that we spent, like, you know, I'd, I'd read this essay a few times and made seven pages of notes on right. it, you know, like, and stuff like that that takes hours. Yeah. And, and I want to put some of the time. Meanwhile, I think the show needs some technical work. Uh-huh. Like, I want to... F- figure out how to do a nice setup here where we could get someone on Skype mm-hmm. and make that work and sound okay. We want to sleep up our little janitor's closet we brought we <laughs> recorded. We have to get this room cleaned up. There's there's stuff that we're missing that we can't find. There's still oh, winter hardware. clothes that we haven't found. Yeah, and it's full on winter here. So we've got to do that. Yeah. Well, and, and <clears throat> we're just putting too yeah. much time pressure on ourselves. Right. So this is like a little sabbatical where we can yeah. kind of clean things up a little bit literally clean things up and figure also out. do some setup stuff and some sort of technical prep and maybe get ahead of you know you want to get ahead on actually writing some content for future right, shows right there's a, there's a few shows i've had an idea to do um two that come immediately to mind uh, one on the enlightenment one yeah. on the revolutionary war 
probably two in the revolution. Those aren't obviously. even it, it, yeah. you mean a series of twelve. <laughs> right, right. So it's like just it's gonna grow. It's gonna. There's a lot that I would like to do, and I just haven't had the time to do. Yeah. So I want to invest this time in doing some of that prep work and writing. Meanwhile, on the plus side, we have the kids fairly accustomed to the idea that we're going to be spending four to six hours on the weekend like working on this, working on this and they're going to have to entertain themselves for part of the Saturday right. or, and or Sunday. So so we so maybe we can get, use continue that to use that time and not yeah. shock them. You know? Right. Well, and, and, That's my hope. Yeah. I'm also trying to get an essay done by the end of the year. You know, never <laughs> one not to procrastinate. Right? That's not us. <laughs> Wait, that's exactly us. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm trying to get an essay finished by the end of the year. Days. Uh, hopefully for publication in a little magazine, and um, we'll see if it gets. You know, I'll let you know if it if it if it makes it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you where you can read it if it does actually get actually published. To, if it doesn't, version. we'll just pretend that never happened. Yeah, like that little clip thing. So yeah. Yeah. Life can be convenient that way. Yep. So hopefully this will be a fruitful little sabbatical. We'll come back with some greater and interesting uh, content and just a little less frazzled yeah and uh yeah we're also trying to think of whether we want to do and and anything and or what to do to uh try and grow our audience a bit at some point yeah i'd like to reach more people i think the people we're reaching now it's fine we have a small but enthusiastic following yeah yeah. and and frankly we're really going to keep doing this i want to reach more people you want to reach more people i was going to say that i'm I find doing this rewarding yes. intrinsically. Uh, well, that's I I have made like several two three hundred podcasts so far, right? Since going back to about two thousand six, mm-hmm. and it's kind of for me it's the same as blogging, yeah. right? I put the stuff out there; it satisfies me. If other people like it, that's great. Yeah, but. Uh, but I think that I it actually is time. I'm 50, you know, mm-hmm. that I really, if, if I'm going to make a go at doing something a little bigger with more of an audience, either in music or in this kind of production or writing either, and all three actually, yeah, and, you know, that I need to step up my game and focus, you know. Oh, yeah. And yeah. doing it regularly for, <clears throat> what, 20, 24 weeks or 20 weeks or yeah, something. Several months. Yes. Was, has been a great uh, discipline. Yes. And sometimes I think the shows suffer a little bit from tr- trying to force them out on the schedule. But I think we're trending. But better. we're trending up. We're, we're, trending we're up. improving. We're definitely treading water. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. And hopefully after a little break, we'll come back, um, come back stronger. That's the plan. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for listening. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Bye-bye.